used to your big truck, man. No. Bad. <laughs> no shave November's over there. <laughs> Give it time. It's that kind of year already. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's caucus meeting. Um, first item onto the agenda is move to the new middle school. I just wanted to take an opportunity to publicly thank so many people. Um, we had a tremendous amount of help um, really beginning throughout the course of the fall uh, that enabled us to pull off a mid-year move. And uh, from our teachers and our staff at the building put in tremendous amount of time and really did uh, a great job even working um, over the break to really make sure that the building was ready to go for our students to come back to our moving company. Gasly's was excellent, um, very flexible with us and worked with everybody um, you know, to get things where they needed to be. And to uh, Dr. Myers, who really, um, if you recall back in September, I said one of the first things I'd like you to do is focus on that transition. So a lot of credit um, goes to Dr. Myers for her organization and kind of getting people in the right spot. So I wanna, wanna publicly thank her for her efforts. Uh, the middle school administrator, Mr. Shelley, Mr. Jenkins, for their leadership. I'm um, continued leadership now. Each day something's coming up, but they both have done a great job of supporting teachers, parents, students, kind of getting the building uh, to this point and certainly continuing to review what we're doing and, and letting contractors know of issues that are popping up. And we're just real appreciative of, of their work. Uh, to uh, Justin and the maintenance, uh, Jason Ehlers and Dave Cook and Marlon and all the maintenance guys, really, if you were here on campus, you saw somebody moving something at some point somewhere and really just appreciate the teamwork um, from all of those individuals that are still doing work now at the old middle school, but they all really stepped up and just kind of pitched in and uh, you know, got, things, um, got things done, which is, which is great. And then you know, finally to our students and our parents, um, I was actually in the building the first day the kids walked through before the break, recorded a little video and the look on their face and the things that they had to say was, was incredible. It was really, really an awesome, special moment. And so we appreciate their flexibility and making such a, a move um, and adapting. And, and we're still going to continue to do that. But there is a lot of people, um, including um, support staff from across the district. I know the ladies in our office stopped what they were doing and went down to help clean. And uh, we just really appreciate that. And just want to thank everybody for their efforts um, to get us moved into the middle school. Um, Dr. January 25th. I, Dr. 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 Sal, I just wanted to add one thing too. I was, I was in one day and just saw you and Mr. Peart in there moving stuff around too. So I just wanted to say thank you to you as well. You, know, I, you were also there doing the, doing the work and so was Mr. Peart. So I just thought that was also important to bring up. So thank you for doing that. Thanks, sure. Um, January 25th. Um, is Tuesday, buildings and grounds meeting. If you remember last month, um, we modified the, the motion to make buildings and grounds on Tuesdays at six o'clock. At this point in time, we have no agenda items. So like we've been doing, we'll kind of keep you posted um, if we do need to um, have the meeting, uh, but at least wanted to put that out there that that's the, that's the date, okay? Moving on to the agenda, personnel. So you have a few uh, personnel here. A, 1A um, is a recommendation for elementary learning support teachers. So we're very um, excited to make this recommendation. Um, and then obviously the uh, district where um, Kelsey's coming from is going to hold her um, for a period of time, but we're excited to have Kelsey on board. 2A um, is an elementary evening custodian. Uh, B is middle school food service. And C is high school food service. As, as we've been saying, we've had a fair amount of openings and I'm thrilled to see uh, some recommendations for these open positions. Number three is adding to the support staff substitute with uh, Lori Kuhn. And that's it for, excuse me, our personnel. Other agenda items.
B, um, yearly going out to bids for next school year with the IU 22-23. Mr. Peart, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Uh, this is just the normal uh, approval process. Um, then you'll later on, you'll receive the amounts that will be approved. Uh, but this is just allowing us to go out and, and get the bid uh, started. C is an extracurricular contract donation. And so every year we have this position that we budget for the concession stand manager. Um, and we typically donate that money, in this case, $950 to the booster club. So the recommendation is seen here. Letter D is our recommendation to have Mr. Peart um, and Doug appear um, and recommended to represent the school district with the tax bureau and the tax collect collection committees. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Again, this is the uh, same as we've always have done it. Um, it's a thrilling, exciting meeting, all of them. Um, but uh, yes, this is just normal process right here. Letter E, audit report, we will go over later in the agenda. Um, letter F, you can see uh, several substitute dr bus drivers for Roars. Letter G, uh, change order, new middle school project, Mr. Peart. Okay, um, so we are coming down the home stretch with all the change orders. Um, if you take a notice, this this is actually uh, a net credit back to us of twenty six thousand dollars, almost twenty seven. Um, the bulk of that has to deal with finally getting getting the total amount of the credit for our courtyard uh, because the courtyard everything was donated. Uh, to us. So as a result, we had to get that amount back from ECI, our general contractor. Um, so that's what the two large credit amounts are. Um, and then we have obviously some other miscellaneous things here. Uh, roof frames uh, that needed adjusted due to design uh, that needed to change in the amount of $1,223. Um, some grading to adjust for the ADA slopes uh, in the parking areas um, for an amount of $3,571. Uh, part of the spec that was in the original bid uh, did have an asphalt price index adjustment. Uh, and like everything else, from the time that the bid went out until the pavement was down, uh, that index increased. So that amount of that change order is $4,357. We had uh, some door hardware changes that we requested uh, and that amount is $603. Um, and per the uh, code inspector, he required us to put stone wedges and slopes uh, to the temporary uh, sidewalks that were in the courtyard. Uh, that amounted to $2,018. Um, the, all the equipment, when I say the equipment, I mean the basketball hoops, the divider and the gymnasium is all controlled by a touch screen. Uh, and given that it was in a gym, the original spec did not have a protective cage over it. Uh, so we wanted to do that. So that controls everything. We wanted that to be protected. So that cost was $526. Um, there was some site signage as far as road signs um, and other uh, signage out in front and behind the building that was added. Uh, that was a total of $1,563. And then we had some door lock changes in the amount of $970. So all those together, um, we had a credit back to the district of $26,907. Um, and then I'll just move on to the, the next change order, uh, which was for the electrical contractor low bar. Um, this has to relate to, um, in the original spec uh, that was done, the phone jacks uh, were at the door. Um, and that is not where ultimately we wanted them to be placed. So in order to do that, there was wiring that needed to be done uh, and that amount of wiring for the relocation of the wall phone jacks was $6,901.82.
So that is the um, change orders related for tomorrow night's meeting for approval. So just a, a heads up, um, kind of related to the electrical. So when we were, the um, <clears throat> engineers were putting together the documents for the bid, um, the um, consultant that we used to do the MEP mechanical engineering process, they changed electrical engineers in the middle of the project. And the result of that was missed work. Um, for example, there, there were a couple of rooms that had, there were no uh, data drops for telephones at all. We used the data to be able to, to connect the telephones. Um, fortunately, we're able to use some wireless phones now. But the one that will be coming, and it's the reason I'm sharing, is that we put the garage doors downstairs and up upstairs. As we're walking through, I said, how do we put them up? There was no power, and it wasn't in the spec. And so we have uh, 10 garage doors that, are, that, are, that um, are by design. Some of them are in, some of them are backward, but there's no power to them. So that will be a process coming that we'll have to um, to take care of. And it was just an oversight from there. So I just wanted to share that up front um, because we certainly don't want to do them by hand in the classroom. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Peart. Dr. Oscar, I just had a yes, quick sir. question. Can, <clears throat> can you, what's our uh, overall tracking right now for the project for the middle school? How, how it compares to staying on budget? So the dollar amount that we're under, given the value engineering that we performed back at the very beginning of the project, um, the latest number that we have, and there are more coming, I mean, nothing substantial by any stretch, but we're, it's, we're under $645,000. Oh, thank you. Letter I. Um, oh, excuse me, I have a question about the, um, did anybody check about the guardrails? Like, because you know that big drop when we toured the new middle school on 94? Or did anybody check to see if we could get guardrails put up? Yes, so we have that information. And actually, we have a, a meeting tomorrow with um, ELA, who did all of the site work. They were the civil engineer for the project. So we actually have a, a meeting with them tomorrow uh, to, to discuss that item, a bunch of other things civil engineer-wise for them. So I will follow up with you once I kind of get the lowdown of what that looks like. Is that something that we can do? What's PennDOT's involvement? Is that something PennDOT does? So it's on the radar and I'll have more tomorrow. Thank you. Welcome. Letter I, teacher contract approval. Um, we're we're going to be seeking approval and we'll talk about that item specifically in um, executive session later. Letter K, a few um, overnight trips and Sunday events. Um, this is one of those uh, uh, board policies that's on my radar that uh, previously we've talked about Sunday events that right now a policy requires board approval for Sunday events. And um, in the past, um, sometimes the, the advisors are a little late getting that request in. And so it has jeopardized the potential of going on trips. So I want to revisit that policy of what the required for approval. We don't do a lot. A lot of it has to do with student council going to a conference, but sometimes we'll have um, a robotics team that will qualify for some event and they, they win something middle of the week and then they need to be able to go somewhere for a Sunday event. So that that this brought back the uh, my desire to revisit that policy, but here you can see, um, and you're gonna be hearing more in a little bit about K-1, the senior class trip, and then two, um, you can see the FFA uh, to attend the ACES uh, conference. Conference, sorry. Okay, uh, that's it for the agenda. I will circle back and go to finances, Mr. Peart. Okay, uh, starting with the general fund, we had a beginning balance of fourteen million eighty-seven thousand thirty-six dollars and eighty-six cents. We had revenue for the month of $2,872,487.93. We had payroll expenditures of $1,082,345.04 and other expenditures of $2,232,405.62, leaving an ending balance of $13,644,774.13. Looking over the revenue, uh, very standard for this time of year. If you have any specific questions on the revenue, pl please let me know. 
to have a quick question, Justin. Yep. Um, last month, the expenditures were 397,786. And this month they're $442,262. Do you know when that money is going to be coming from the state to reimburse us for the COVID expenses, which led to the initial shortfall here? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a three month period, three year period. So Essers two is from 2020 to 2023, okay? Uh, we're currently receiving money uh, right now. Um, there's no guarantee when we will receive all that money. I can tell you that currently we've been receiving approximately $22,000 quarterly. Um, and it's showing that we have over uh, 500,000 left to receive um, of that money. 22,000 quarterly. Um, half a million dollars. So we'll get in about 30 years at that base. <laughs> um, I mean, the, I'm just looking at this and it's taken so long for us to get the money back. And well, we're... But I think what, I don't want you to become confused that this isn't just, I mean, yes, the, the Esther's money and the federal money plays into this, but this is normal process. Because if you recall what I mentioned last month, the way that the um, revenue flows and the expenditures. So for July, August, September, I mean, I haven't looked at them, but I would say for their first four months, five months of the year, your revenues are going to exceed your expenditures. Early on, July and August and September are going to be huge exceeding because you get front loaded the money because your majority of your money comes from real estate taxes. That collection is at the very beginning of the school year. So your revenues come up, your expenditures are low. So they're fighting against each other now your revenues are coming down, your expenses are going up. So in the end, it's going to, based on your budget, obviously, um, you're going to either be short by the amount that you thought you would be, um, or, I mean, very rarely is it gonna wash out. I mean, we've had years where our revenues have been higher than the expenses um, for multiple reasons, uh, but this is a normal occurrence. So I don't want you to think that's just because of the, of the federal funding that's slow and coming in okay so it's it's a normal trend that this is happening and, and that's because there's a discount period for paying your taxes early correct yes mm -hmm. and that's why a lot of i don't know we could come up with a percent 70 percent of our taxpayers pay early because they want to get that discount that's why you'll see the revenue coming in and then and slowly you get stragglers throughout the course of the year thank you so then you'll just see that eventually this will be less negative and balance out a little bit. Well, but the, the bigger number to be concerned about is that accumulated total. So as you can see, we're 5.6 million to the good as far as revenues to expend. So the other, another way to look at it is what, based on our budget, what do we project that number to be at the, the accumulated total at the end of the year? Because that, that's the number we really want to watch, right? Because ideally we want to be where his budget predicted us to be. Ebbs and flows with the taxes coming and going. I get that. And learning curve. Right. No, no, but no this worries. Is, and I, I appreciate that. But I'm just trying to, I'm just watching the number go more and more negative. And what I'm curious about was, you know, is one, we should have more money coming to us from the government to reimburse what we were short. And we should start to see this number go less negative as we proceed into the new year. Is that accurate? What I will say is that we are definitely, we have spent more money, more federal money, okay, as far as Essers and Title, uh, Essers II. Um, we've definitely spent more, we have more expenditures than we have rep, okay. Um, because we know we are going to get that revenue at some point. So um, in whether it's this fiscal year or whether it's next fiscal year, that's when it's going to balance out on Esther's two. Esther's three will start, uh, we'll be starting to spend that out once we have Esther's two spent out. Um, so I, I would focus more on the accumulated total, given the fact that that's what our budget and our projections are going to be on. So that $5.6 million accumulated total, once that number starts getting into the negative, 
then if that's not what we anticipated, and I'm about to tell you what I'm anticipating right now, but that number is going to fluctuate because we have six more months to go yet in this year and a lot can happen. Um, that's when, if there's any concern, that's when it should happen. So, so just to let everybody know the budget deficit when the 21, 2020, I'm sorry, 2021, 2022 budget was passed was $2.1 million. That was what the budget deficit was. Okay. Currently my estimates are showing that the deficit is going to be 1.3 million. So that's an $800,000 to the good, if you will, um, where we're sitting at right now. Now, like I said, projections change. I'll be updating those projections every month from here to the till the end of June when you will pass the final budget. So that's something I will highlight every year, every month at, a, at the regular board meeting, a regular caucus for the budget presentation. But that's just showing you. So right now, that number, that $5.6 million number, based on the budget, should be negative 2.1 at the end of June. And what I'm saying right now, projections are showing that number is going to be negative 1.3. It's good that it's less negative. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's good. But yeah. um, my question is, we keep going further into the negative. Is that standard? cost of running things that are running us into the negative or is it deficit spending that is putting us further into the negative? It's, it's following that the budget was approved that for that year. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And just for clarity, we can deficit spend. We have to have a balanced budget. Got unlike you other government entities. <laughs> so, so, so to Justin's learning point, curve, we, the, the board, the board passed the budget that was expecting us to use $2.1 million of fund balance to balance the budget. Yeah, we have the money. We have it. Okay. Justin has altered that right now, predicting that we're only going to have to spend 1.3 of instead of two, which is a really good thing. $800,000 swing is outstanding. We'll, we'll take that. So I don't want to jinx it. So I don't want to talk too much about it, but right now that's, that's trending. So, I think what you're getting caught up on is the month to month. If people don't pay their taxes in a given month, that's nothing, you know, some, they're, they're front loading those. It really matters at the end of the year because that's when we have to, that's what the audit is all about. You have to account for revenues, expenditures, and that's when you'll, you'll start to see Justin do the uh, predictions as we go out each month. that will kind of tighten up and I think it'll make more sense. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so to, is any any other specific questions related to the revenue for for this month? Okay, uh, moving on to the expenditures. Um, our higher dollar amounts are our utilities, our cyber charter schools, and our uh, contracted services. If you have any specific questions on any of the expenditures for this month, please let me know. Okay, uh, moving on to the cafeteria fund. We had a beginning balance of $47,300.19. We had revenue of $147,222.52. We had payroll expenditures of $60,116.79 and other expenditures of $53,069.71, leaving an ending balance of $81,336.21. Factoring in the federal and state reimbursement for December, we're at $165,263.76. Looking at the revenue, uh, very standard. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. That, that just for context, that number is unbelievable to have a, a positive in the cafeteria. And then Justin, just to add, um, have you received anything in federal, re, uh, they're going to increase reimbursement per meal 25 cents because of the in, uh, increase in food cost and ability to get that. So that what we're reimbursed is actually going to go up. Correct. Yeah, that's uh, that's through the end of this school year. Um, there's a there's 
a fair amount of uncertainty uh, as far as what they're going to do for next year because all lunches are free up through the end of this school year. So the challenge exists as to hoping they give us plenty of notice because currently families are not submitting their free and reduced applications because they don't have to. Um, and what's going to occur is if they don't, they will fall on full pay and then there'll be a, a law of getting the, the um, free and reduced status that they deserve, but they didn't fill out the form because they haven't had to for the last two years. Um, so we're just hopeful that they give that communication out in plenty of time, uh, but then there'll have to be a major blast of information out to all families to get that um, information so everyone's aware that it's back to pre-COVID with how uh, free and reduced and full pay lunches work. Um, looking at the expenditures, again, very standard for uh, food service. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, moving on to the capital reserve fund. We had a beginning balance of $883,477.44. We had interest revenue of $66.58 and expenditures of $16,253.22, leaving an ending balance of $867,290.80. Looking at the expenditures, um, we had uh, the GMS, which is for the uh, RACB funding, uh, and then we had our final payment for the marquee uh, out front, and then the last one is for the work that was needed for our well pump that went bad uh, behind the baseball field. Um, that needed replaced and that was the work for that. On to the construction fund, we had a beginning balance of $9,028,789.52. We had interest revenue of $92.05 and expenditures of $2,442,169.95. Leaving an ending balance of six million five hundred eighty-six thousand seven hundred eleven dollars and sixty-two cents. Um, looking over the expenditures, um, the field turf uh, was the final payment for the turf field at the new middle school. Uh, the Cappy Associates that was our final payment for the wastewater plant, uh, and the rest of the um, expenditures are all related to the new middle school project. And then last but not least, the scholarship fund, we had a beginning balance of $22,989.57 and interest income of $1.95, leaving an ending balance of $22,991.52. Hey, Josh, I wanna go back to the uh, construction fund. You have a, a line item there for art supplies or supplies, creative arts. Does that? Yes. And that's for the construction, that's construction. That is correct because okay. we had it to just buy- sounds a little like not construction, that's all. Yeah, the creative arts, um, we had equipment that was bought directly for their classrooms okay. based on the design and the need uh, as a result of the design, so okay. yes. Thank you. All right, we will go to go through consent agenda. We have um, our minutes, our fund reports. Then moving on, um, personnel A3 can move to consent. Uh, authorization to seek bids letter B can go consent. C, no, D. The recommendations for the committees can go to consent. Audit report, no. Substitute bus drivers can go to consent. G and H, no, I know. Um, K can go to um, consent. That'll be it. And that leads me to tonight. Um, we have our senior class advisors, Lori King, Deb Lassone are here to present to you information about the senior class trip. So I'm going to 
navigate the presentation as the ladies um, go through and share with you. So I asked them, I'm at their mercy and want, when they want me to change slides, so. Can you hear? Yep. All right. My name is Lori King, and this is Deborah Stone. We are the class advisors to the class of 2022. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you this evening. The class has worked really hard for fundraising. Thank you. So the trip we're proposing, the students have decided they would like to go to Williamsburg, Virginia. Can you guys hear me? Okay, they'd like to go to Williamsburg, Virginia for their trip. Um, it's going to be an overnight trip, two days the first day. They would like to um, go to Colonial Williamsburg and tour the, uh, the historic area and see all the sites there. Then we will come back, check into the hotel. Uh, we're planning on providing a pizza party for them and some planned activities and supervised free time. I know we've had the trip in 2018. The kids kind of found some things to do, but we all did it together in the same room, you know, um, as a group. So they'll find things to do as well. Um, overnight, our plan then is to, you know, have them stay overnight and the chaperones we take with us will be monitoring the hallways all night long. We'll have at least two chaperones in the halls all night. Um, the company that we're, planning the trip with and the hotel that we're using um, are well aware of who's, how it is hosting students and things like that and safety protocols and things that we'll need. So the second day of the trip, we will have breakfast at the hotel and then board the buses for a day at Williamsburg at Bush Gardens um, for that day and then uh, where the kids will have lunch on their own and then come back and in the evening, probably arriving back around 11 o'clock. So it'll be two full days of activities. Okay. So some of the things that we dealt with before when we planned the trip and things are requested in order for us to do an overnight trip of this extent, because we're looking at close to a hundred people going. Okay. We've sent out surveys and had the students respond of who was definitely interested. And uh, right now that's the amount that we're working with. But one of the things we did before and we plan to do is to take a nurse with us. We didn't have any issues before needing a nurse, but if students need medications that need to be handed out or there was a few that had headaches, things like that, um, with all safety concerns, you know, we will provide a nurse. Students for the hotel that we're staying at will be assigned six to a room with two double beds and a queen, and a queen sofa bed. Um, and like I said before, the company, Colonial Connections and Embassy Suites, as well as bus lines, who is who we're planning on using for buses um, have dealt with these uh, large trips before and have given us good information on, on where to stay and what to do there. So we plan on taking at least 10 chaperones, which is what we had done before, and um, giving a schedule for those when they're going to be on duty to uh, monitor hallways and things like that. The Students will be chaperoned at all times. They'll, they'll be able to walk through Colonial Williamsburg and things like that, but all the chaperones will be available. Um, and in the evening, nobody will be leaving the hotel. We'll have rules for where the kids, you know, the hotel, the doors to the rooms will need to stay open until it's time for bed. And then no one is allowed out without being escorted by one of the chaperones. 
and the rooms are all interior rooms, so they won't have access to windows or outdoor facilities. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, and the students are also aware, we've talked about the students already, and they understand that um, whatever COVID guidelines are in effect, you know, for our school, for um, PDE, but also the Virginia Commonwealth and their place of business have different COVID rules at this time and may change until then, but we would need to follow their rules. So we can change to the next. Thank you. Okay. This is a breakdown on what the cost is of the trip. Our biggest expense overall is the buses. So that's a significant expense. Um, what we're planning, it, we've already budgeted four charter buses because of the distance to Williamsburg and the time of day that we're going with fresh hour and things like that. We've already, uh, the buses, the bus company has given us the best time to leave and that kind of thing. But that's our plan. So our estimated cost of the trip is 17,000 at this point, $395. And that's based on two buses, you know, no more than a hundred people. And that's what the kids have indicated to us so far, but we, you know, make contingency plans if that changes. So if you can go to the next slide, we'll explain that. Okay. So the senior class will pay for the majority of the expenses from their class account. We currently have a balance of $16,869. And we have two more food truck, food truck events fund, uh, planned. So we plan to have more than enough to pay for the trip. The only problem that we would run into, okay, is if we have, besides the kids that have already said that they were interested in going, we sent out surveys to everybody, you know, and got as many surveys as we could possibly get back. Multiple reminders. Multiple reminders. And um, so we will need two buses. If we would need to go to a third bus or a third mode of transportation, that would raise our costs significantly. But at the same time, here's what we and the students have decided, that with that being said, the most we would want any of the students to pay would be no more than $75. This does not mean that the students are paying anything at this point, but if we have to get another bus and it has to be divided among the group, we feel that that would be the most expensive, uh, the, the most expensive portion and the highest amount that a student would have to pay. And if so, we would maybe then adjust and go to school buses if we had to, or make adjust in some of the activities that we're doing so that students would never have to pay any more than $75. Okay. Um, the only additional student cost at this point would be lunch at Bush, at lunch at Bush Gardens and fast food on the way home or any souvenirs and additional food purchases that they would be planning for because we're planning on feeding them breakfast when they get on the bus the first day through the, we've already talked, cafeteria has been great and they're going to provide us breakfast and a bag lunch for when we get there. Um, and then we have the pizza party planned for the evening and then the next morning the hotel's providing us breakfast. So they would just need lunch at Bush Gardens. And then we'll probably do a fast food stop on the way home to give them some. Then that would be their only expenses. Now, again, if our fundraisers are as successful as previous fundraisers, we may even have enough to cover some of that cost. So. Do you have any questions or concerns? I have a basic question, um, Dan Chubb here. And my question is, because uh, I've seen it says it needs board's approval. What's the approval for this? Is there, I guess it's a common question, what are we approving? Just them to go out of state? Just to go allowing it. On an overnight trip? Okay. Yep. Is there, what's that? No. I don't know if there's some kind of liability or something the board takes on because- No, of, just historically overnight trips have required board approval. Okay. If there was an incident or something like that, is there a reporting procedure in place that the board has to be aware of or anything like that? Or I would report back kind of like anything else. I mean, basically school rules apply. That's why the chaperones are there. So if there, heaven forbid, happened to be some incident and all of a sudden I get that phone call based on something that's happened, I in turn, if it rises to the board level, would kind of push something back to you all. Okay, great. I mean, it sounds like a fantastic trip. I wish we had something like this when I was in high school. <laughs> so the kids actually came up with this idea. They're very excited about it. And so we knew it was a big endeavor, but we also wanted to make it happen for them because it's their senior year and the last normal of the year they had 
was their freshman year. So we just felt like we wanted to do something really special for them. You know, we kept telling them, you know, as they're raising money and things like that and things were getting canceled and they weren't using them. It's like, okay, we know we're not having prom, but we're, we're really planning for a really epic senior class trip. So. so, and the fact that they raised that much money given our situation is, you know, says a lot about how hard they've worked. What's going to be, are you going to establish a deadline that if people are going to attend the trip, you need to know, because then that will impact everything that you do. Have you thought about that? And what's your timeline? Well, we really depended on board, board approval, but we were talking today that we will have a deadline. And once that deadline set, nobody can add on after that, because I think if you go beyond that deadline, you open it up to a lot of correct um, problems. Probably that'll be sometime in March is usually because till we get um, parent approval and get medical uh, information from them and things like that and get our chaperones established and everything um, at this point. And again, we can only wait so long if we would have to get another bus. We can only wait so long for them to be available. I'm Before assuming that um, it, uh, seniors that are Eagles Academy are also invited. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, definitely. Right. And we'll do a lot of advertising so the kids are very well aware, the parents are aware of the dates, of the trips, of the deadlines. So it'll be really important that we share that information. So we'll share that on all outlets. Do we know if our student athletes already know what championship dates are? I know in the past we've had some, it was usually the band trip uh, that caused some huge consternation for postseason play for some of our our athletes. Yes. At, at this point, there is not anything going on. You know, um, there's, there's nothing on the calendar as far as that goes. They're right before finals. And at this point from, and I did talk to Dave Orbeck on this, that he foresees nothing at this point. Just double check, make sure the District 3 track meets not that weekend. Because that's a, it's a, roughly around when it is. It's usually around Mother's Day. Okay, and, and we'll runners. double check that. Now, I don't know if that happens on a weekend or yeah, if that's- It actually happens on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay, we'll double check that again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. We will take him. Thank you, ladies. Really okay, appreciate thank it. You. Dr. Myers um, is going to provide us with uh, uh, an update information on next Monday's professional development. Hi, Dr. Myers here. Um, so the January 17th, actually January 17th, Professional Development Day is um, held every year. And essentially, um, we have a lot of different activities scheduled for that particular day in regards to professional learning. Our Each building essentially is, is working through some different things based on needs that they have and goals that they're working towards. Our elementary and middle school teachers are involved in some reading and math trainings uh, that link to some different supplemental resources that we're utilizing with students. Um, specifically, the middle school is going to be attending a data training with iReady, which is the online personalized reading and math program that our students are working through. Uh, for some personalized opportunities to um, achieve. And then our elementary building is um, attending training for uh, problem solving instructional strategy that, uh, again, supplemental that we're utilizing to develop problem solving skills called exemplars. And so some reps from the companies will be here to go through some different aspects of each of the programs. High school teachers will have the opportunity to actually meet as departments, which is not something that they're often able to do as a building because of the way that their structure, the structure of their building is. Um, so a lot of the time that high school will have will be dedicated to department meetings. And then uh, one of the, the just super important to make sure our teachers know that their health and wellness is on our radar, that the afternoon is optional time uh, where we've provided some wellness activities and uh, partnership with Adams County Art Council. They are uh, providing an art and music therapist where teachers have signed up if they choose to attend some different sessions um, on wellness. And then we have um, David Schaefer from uh, Schaefer Elite Fitness who is providing some 
and fitness um, sessions for teachers who've decided to sign up. Um, so those sessions are completely optional. And in, in addition to those sessions, teachers will continue working on their personalized learning plans um, and then any other building initiatives um, that might be occurring during that time. Uh, one of the changes to our personal learning plans this year is that it is linked to teacher evaluations. And so building principals will, would also be utilizing that time to touch base with uh, professional staff to ensure that teachers are working towards their goals and are looking to be able to achieve uh, whatever that goal was that they set forth as far as their own professional learning uh, by the end of the school year. So overall, um, it, you know, the best gift you can give a teacher right now is time. And so they have a lot of flexibility this day to kind of center their professional learning around their needs and I'm happy to be able to provide that to them. I just had a quick question. Jen Goldhan here. Um, what supplemental learning tools would they be working from? The, the, it's actually the supplement that we're using iReady, which is an online reading and math program. Um, we used Dreambox last year, so it's very similar to that, but it's for reading and math. So we've actually removed Dreambox um, because iReady was a more comprehensive tool that we were able to utilize and use um, some learning loss funds to purchase K through eight. So essentially it's online personalized learning for students where they're taking benchmark testing. And then the adaptive program is utilizing the results from those benchmark testing from that benchmark testing to personalize a learning path for reading and for math. Um, the supplemental program that elementary is utilizing is called exemplars, which is a, um, they're, they are problem solving, um, like word problems. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain that, but they're essentially word problems that encourage different ways for problem solving and thinking in math. And so it's um, something that they've implemented. I believe this is the first year that they're implementing. And so they're receiving just some professional development from the company in regards to that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next topic is 22-23 school calendar. Um, this is a draft I've shared with the association already, and actually they've already provided feedback that they're good. And so a few highlights, very typical calendar, what we've done in the past. So if you take a look, first day of uh, student day is August 18th, with the first three days, 15, 16, 17, are the teacher days. It keeps the uh, uh, elongated Labor Day weekend with the Friday, Monday, um, and then again in October, having the PD day on the Friday, Monday with the end of the first marking period, October 24th. Uh, beginning of November, third and fourth are the uh, parent-teacher conferences and also keeps the Wednesday before Thanksgiving um, as a day off. And so that would be Wednesday through Monday, again, exactly like this year. And if you take a peek in December, uh, the Chris Christmas day falls on a Sunday. So we would be looking at a half day on the 22nd off the 23rd and scooting over into January, we would have off that Monday. So it's a little bit of a longer break, but brings kids back on Tuesday, January 3rd, which is a, which is a nice break. But again, ends the second marking period fairly early on January 11th. Um, gives us uh, the Friday after, which is typically when we start to finalize, we do finalize report cards for the second marking period and then MLK day off. And then you can see the extended President's Day weekend going into March where we have some PD days uh, that really gear up towards parent-teacher conferences yet again. And then April is Good Friday and Easter, and we have historically had the Tuesday off as well. Um, and essentially this puts the last student day, May 25th, which again is pretty, the goal is, has been to keep it before Memorial Day, so um, it will do that. Um, it does break up the teacher PD days, but uh, we've also had uh, swap days that if teachers do certain work, they don't have to attend that last uh, PD day. So that typically makes sense. I, I really am not a big fan of bringing people back after holiday for one day, um, but that's the way it's designed now. And if you take a look, our, our makeup days are relatively same. We try to prioritize um, what those days are. And if you note here, we've prioritized so that, and this has come from feedback over the years to make sure that families can plan for holidays. And so if you take a look at, at April, um, Good Friday is never a makeup day, and the Monday after Easter is never a makeup day. So that guarantees a four-day weekend, and that's been feedback, and we just think that that's important for people to plan. So um, 
if you compare this calendar to this year, it's very, very similar. Um, so we're, um, again, just wanted to share this with you. Um, we'll be seeking approval next month. Just wanted to kind of put this out there. Um, for instance, I, I, we just found a, a typo with the date and the time. So we just want to, we'll have it set for a, for a month and we'll bring it back to you for approval in February. And we also, by the way, um, the other districts in the county, we share calendars because we share programs. And so I'm still waiting to see some of the, the school calendars for a couple of the other school districts. And we do really try to maintain a fairly consistent calendar because of ACTI um, and uh, sharing of the consortium programs that we have. So Dr. Hodges, questions, yes. Yes, quick question. Um, other members, actually several members in the community have kind of commented about the early return in August. Is there a way we can move that first day back a week? Because people are still vacationing that third week. Um, I don't know how it would affect the rest of the calendar, but if we can move the first day back from the 18th to the 25th, I think we're coming back a little too early in August, as well as other people in the community. That would push um, the last day of school to one, two, three, four, five, uh, June 5th. So that's the impact. And that... And ironically, that's what drove us to where we are today is because the community said they wanted to, they wanted to end school earlier. Um, but to your point, and, and, and I'll add to that, to one of the things, this is, this is late for us doing a calendar. Historically, moving forward, we just had a, had a lot going on. We approved this calendar typically in November because that allows families to plan vacations next year. And so we've tried to really stick to it, uh, to a relatively consistent schedule, but that's why we do it early in the fall so people can plan those vacations. Okay, thank you. Yep. And the other thing too is, uh, and this is the feedback I remember when, when we also we pulled it back is like, with sports start, right? So for our kids, in the, at least in the middle school and the high school, their, their summer vacations were over. So I, I know I can see elementary school saying, well, you know, that doesn't really impact them. And, you know, by the way, I'm a guy that came for and still kind of like the idea of starting after Labor Day. But I can tell you being on that schedule, I hated ending June 21st. <laughs> yeah. And good, good point. So right now, PIAA August 8th is the heat acclimation and they and the official fall is August 15th. Fair enough. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Hotchkiss. Was there a, in the past, does it matter to mark which days are the possible snow makeup days? Or I know you, you just talked about that around Easter. Didn't we, wasn't at some point the calendar used to be marked for potential snow makeup days? And does that, is that important? What I'm, I'm. They're listed at the bottom. Yeah. Makeup days on the left. Small print. That's all right. Small print. And so, you know, one of the topics, and, I, and this is, I'm going to use this as an opportunity. And <laughs> so we just, we, we, um, we just had a snow day. And so we've got the, the February day as a makeup day. And um, I've got a few questions. And, and the question was, is the makeup day going to be an in-person day or a virtual day? Um, right now I'm leading to in-person. Is kind of where I'm at, but it's it's a question, and there and we have we have it such that we can have some flexibility. I'm just taking this opportunity to share with you kind of where we are. I just want to circle back with our administrative team, but that's that's where I'm landing, is uh, is that it will be an in-person makeup day. Okay. All right, moving on. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it off to Mr. Peart. You have the next couple of topics. So item 11, audit report. You you want to take over, correct? So let me. Stop my screen share. All yours. Did I just, did I just, did I just disconnect? Do you see me? Uh, no, you're connected. Okay. 
Uh, hold on a sec. Copy. Are you screen sharing? So go, go to the, go to the, go to. Excuse me. Okay, sorry for the delay, a little technical difficulty there. But um, so I just wanted to um, provide a little bit uh, a brief overview of, of the audit. Um, I know we have quite a few new board members. So I know the document itself is pretty massive uh, and can be very overwhelming. Um, but um, so to begin the audit, audit process begins in July every year uh, when we do a lot of internal things in the business office to get ready for the auditors to show up. Um, they come out traditionally like the last full week in August. Uh, there's three auditors that come out and they're here all week reviewing documents and get, preparing the information they need uh, and gathering the information they need from our office. Um, and then, uh, that allows them to, to do, prepare the 78 page document that you all see now, okay? Um, so the local audit process follow, follows the governmental auditing standards that's issued by the comptroller uh, of the gen general of the United States. And it's a very specific review of the district's financial, uh, financials for the fiscal year. Um, the most challenging part of it is to boil it down to a layman's terms, um, how, what it means for the district. Um, and if you're not an accountant, um, it's very overwhelming. Uh, and even for a lot of accountants, it's a lot of stuff in here that really doesn't pertain to what we need to do. And when I say we, I mean the board and the administration, uh, because there's a lot of things in here that they focus on. If the district would ever shut its doors, this is the result of what that would be. Well, we're a public school district. We're never gonna shut our doors, um, but following the governmental auditing standards, that's what they have to provide. Uh, and that's what a lot of the um, statements in here and the uh, backup of footnotes relates to. So it's a lot of detailed things that really don't pertain to what we do on a yearly basis. Um, so I just wanted to make that, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that you didn't understand what you were doing or any, because it's very overwhelming for everybody um, when you look at it from that perspective. So the thing I like to focus on, and I think what makes the most sense to uh, a lot of people is the MDNA section, which is the first section that we provide to the auditing firm uh, based on the um, statements that they provide us. So this is where we break down the local audit into an easier format to understand and comprehend. Um, and then also, like I say here, it highlights the audited ending fund balance amount for the general fund. And that is ultimately our savings account, which we were talking about earlier. Um, so that's what is, the end all be all, uh, that's the audited figure that we start this current fiscal year we're in now uh, for 21-22. So talking about what um, I mentioned earlier about my estimates compared to the actuals. Uh, so this would have been last year. Um, so we estimated that the fund balance, we would utilize $1.3 million worth of fund balance based off the estimates. Um, the final audit shows that we utilize $743,530 of the fund balance. And as you can see here, the main reason has to deal with this federal money. Okay. So we received um, that amount of money, $370,000 between July, August, and September. And the auditors believe that that should have been accrued. And what I mean by accrued, 
that means pulling it back to the 2021 year, okay? We received it in the 21-22 fiscal year, accruing it back to the 2021. So doing yeah. that. Excuse me, but did you have any documentation that will allow you to take, make that accrual? Because you can't just accrue something if you don't know you're, if it, you don't know you're gonna get it, for sure, right? That money was, we, we received that money in July, August, and September. Right, but. Physically received it. So that was their determination. So they said you should have accrued it even. Back to 2021. But you already closed the books. That's their, they have the right to do that. Wow. So, I mean, ultimately it was in my projections when we get to next month's budget presentation, the three-year projections, it was ultimately in 21-22. Now it's just doing a show in 2021. It's a matter of what year it goes in. It's, 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 I'm not nearly as concerned if it would have been expenses. Revenue is not as big of a concern. It's just what year they decided. That's, I'm just explaining why there was that, a difference. Because if you take that out, and you, I mean, I'm almost spot on to the original estimate. Um, so, I mean, with that difference, you're only, we're only at $191,000 or 0.57% of the overall budget. So... That's what I was getting at. Do you have a responsibility that you have to close your books within so many days of the end of the year? Well, we run on a modified accrual counting, and that allows up to 90 days accrual. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yes. So I didn't believe that it should just based on the amount of money that it's so scattered, the federal funding, they made that determination to pull it back. Well, and to be clear, I mean, their management letter states there, there were no real deficiencies or call outs. Correct. So that you I mean so it's not like it's any you know we're calling outside the lines here. Right. right. So I just want to Yep. So factoring that all into account, the final audited beginning fund balance for this fiscal year, July 1, 2021, is six million four hundred and thirty eight thousand nine hundred and twenty four dollars. So that's the that's the true number that we work with uh, for our current fiscal year we're in now. Um, and then also that's a good starting point for the 22, 23, uh, budget year as well. Cause that's the last actual number we have as far as a savings account is concerned. Everything else is going to be based on the estimates that I'll update each month as we go from now through June. So we won't know this number for this fiscal year we're in now until next year, this time, you follow what I'm saying? So that's the challenge as we work through this. Um, I wish I could sit here and tell you that I'm only $190,000 off of my estimates every month or every year, but that's not the case uh, because things happen that I'm not aware of uh, or that could really change things. Um, I try to be as conservative as possible, but then also once I get information that I know it's not going to happen, I'm going to either increase it or decrease it based on whatever it may be. But this year just happened to be a good estimating year, if you will. Uh, but I just want to highlight that, that that's, that's the uncertainty as we work through the estimates. But the, right now that's, that's $6,438,924 number. That is a good, hard, solid figure. That number will not change. Okay. So I would just like to publicly thank the ladies in the business office. Um, Jen Heller is the assistant business manager, Jenny Wolf and Missy Swartz. They deal a lot directly with uh, the auditors. Uh, they're nagging them to get the information they need and they're very responsive uh, because honestly, the goal is to get them out as quickly as we can. Um, get them the information they need and, and move on. So they do a great job on getting that information, knowing what they need. Uh, and so I just like to publicly thank them for their hard work. Um, so I, that, as a highlight, that's, I wanted to provide that information for the board. If there's any specific questions or discussions related to the audit, please let me know. I am Jen Gohan. I'm a little confused as far as we were owed money that we should have gotten a few years, like the year before. They're giving it to us now and say, oh, by the way, on the books, we're going to put it in, in this year's audit. Am I understanding that right? Because So 
learning so, curve and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So ESSERS two funding, there was no start date on when that money would start receive, being received, okay? The only dates were when it could be spent, okay? So it can be spent for expenditures from March 13th, 2020 through September, the end of September, 2023. They were your dates. As far as when you receive the revenue, it's anyone's guess, okay? I, can, I guarantee you we are receiving uh, funding currently, okay? We received $370,210 over the months of July, August, and September, okay? So what the auditors are saying is that money, instead of recognizing it in the 21-22 school year, they're making the determination and have made a determination that money is being pulled back to the 2021 school year, okay? So there's no, I mean, in total, the amount that of Esther's two funding that we're supposed to receive is still the exact same. It's just recognizing it in what year. The auditors felt it should be recognized in 2021. I had it in my estimates as being recognized in 21, 22. So now my estimates in 2021 are, the expenditure estimates are higher. So now they're gonna be lower, the actuals, and vice versa come for 21, 22, okay? I'm sorry, revenue. Yes, sorry. I think I got it. Okay. I think. All right. Thank you. Yep. No. Okay. Uh, then I will move on to the um, budget. Okay, so um, this is the first look at our 22-23 uh, general fund budget. So I like to think of this as the 30,000 foot level, okay? So each month at our regular caucus meeting, I will be coming back to the board with um, any updated figures um, that we might receive. Um, and as you can see here through the presentation, and more reference to revenues, but also some highlights of the expenditures. So for example, we generally receive our actual renewal for our insurances uh, in the middle of March. Sometimes we have it for the March meeting, but uh, more than likely it's for the April meeting. Um, so that's where you'll see uh, hopefully a, a fairly significant reduction in our um, healthcare rates uh, as far as what's in the current budget, because right now it's budgeted, budgeted at the cap. Um, some other things, um, so like the governor's uh, budget proposal, that'll affect uh, what would be put in for state re uh, revenue amounts, because currently in the budget, it's budgeted at last year's figures. Um, the same with the federal uh, amount. Um, Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV, as well as Perkins. All those dollar amounts are budgeted at the 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, and that's very common because we do not get those new updated figures and they constantly change even when they're updated uh, until later, mu much later in the budget process. What you'll notice is that the governor will do his budget proposal and they won't have true budget discussions till May. Uh, so at the earliest, some, and it usually starts in the June, which is the frustration from your end because you have to make a decision on numbers that aren't even finalized about what we're getting. Um, but that's what local school boards have to deal with on, a, on a every year basis. So um, just envision that, that you're seeing now is, is what is hopeful. And I'm always very hopeful that this is the highest that it will go. And from here, we work our expenses down, massage them as we get more information and better accurate information. Um, but you will hear a budget presentation from me at a caucus meeting every month from here to June, okay? So 
looking through here, um, just to let everybody know, um, there's at the, the revenues at the first glimpse. So our local revenues, um, and what I did was try to highlight some of the bigger percentage changes um, that it would give you an idea of what caused those changes. Um, so the real estate taxes uh, currently, and again, this is always based on board direction. Uh, the real estate is budgeted at the Act 1 index, which uh, is 4.7%. Um, the earned income tax. This has been a very interesting throughout the entire pandemic because what was projected and what, re what the numbers are showing are two totally different things, two totally different. Um, we were expecting back in 2021 and 21, 22, fairly significant reductions in earned income tax. There was never a dip in our earned income tax the entire way through the pandemic. Never, never once. Um, so that's why you're going to see, uh, I believe it's almost like 11% increase in the earned in income, uh, because if you're basing those percentages are based budget to budget. Uh, if you look at the projections, it's not, it's like a hundred and little over a hundred thousand dollar increase. Um, so that's just getting more real to the number based on what is actually occurring because we've seen no dip. Now, if something happens it, in the economy that we see a dip, then that's a number that's going to change. But I don't, nothing's out there saying that's going to happen. Hopefully the economy gets better. Um, so, but that earned income tax has been very, it's a very good thing. It stayed strong because that's our second leading uh, revenue uh, outside of real estate taxes. Um, the revenue from L other LEAs, that is our consortium students that actually come to our district. So we, are, we have emotional support classes in the high school and the middle school. And we have students that come from Fairfield, Upper Adams. And then we also have one student here at the high school that comes from Southwest. Uh, so we receive tuition from them. Uh, and that's based on uh, the tuition increase that was agreed upon from our consortium. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, the state and federal revenues, uh, there are all are currently budgeted at last year's uh, figures outside of the ones that I know for a fact are changing. So like our rental subsidy, that's based on our uh, debt service schedule uh, for the pieces of the debt service that we get uh, state reimbursement. Um, I know what those payments are. So I adjusted that and that is continuing to come down. Eventually in 23, 24, that will be our final payment uh, from the state for federal uh, first our debt service. Uh, because our current bonds that we have out for the elementary renovation and new middle school, there's zero state reimbursement for those. So uh, eventually that line item will go to zero because the state has totally done away with plan con money. Um, so as far as revenues are concerned, that's, that's where we're at at this point. Um, so moving on to the expenses, um, the salaries, um, this includes the contracted increases for professional staff, as well as the increases for support and administrative. Um, keep in mind, we had the um, increase in the support staff this past year that we increased. Uh, so that factors that in as well. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier about the group insurance. Um, so this has to deal with all of our medical, dental, vision, and life uh, is included in this in this category. So this is all staff members that are currently on our insurance at their current coverage amounts um, and at the 11% cap. So what we're always hopeful for is when the actual renewal comes in, that 11% is lower because then that brings down and that's savings to the budget that I can take right out. And that's most of the time, keep our fingers crossed, is a fairly good chunk of money that can come out to save money for the overall budget. Um, but time will tell on that. And like I said, that usually comes out, occasionally I have it for March, but more than likely it'll be the April board meeting that that will be finalized and I'll know the exact rates for the uh, fiscal next fiscal year. Um, the Social Security and Retirement, I, I mean, these are set rates that we have no control over. Um, 7.65 of every dollar spent it goes for Social Security and retirement. 
is astounding that we have to pay 35.62%. So every dollar of salary, we have to pay 35.62 cents of money for them for every dollar of uh, salary spent. So that's one thing that we have no control over at all. Currently this year, it's 34.94. Okay. So it's not comparing the rates. It's not that big of an increase, but when you stop and think for every dollar spent, you have 35.62 cents that you have to put on top of it. That's significant. Um, the professional educational services for the LIU. Um, this is dealing with our special education students who are placed in IU classes. Um, we had a number of autistic students and students needing interpreting services move into the district uh, during this year, uh, which results in um, a, a fairly significant increase in our overall cost to the IU for services. Um, and I, also as a result of IEP process, we had more students placed in IU classes. Um, so these are the overall reasons for why there's an increase in this area. Um, as you saw, the, the amounts over $850,000 uh, for, for these students. Um, the other professional services, uh, this includes our substitute teaching services, our speech services, and our occupational therapy services. Um, the occupational therapy is something that's new, but what, that, what we were doing is if we went with the way we were doing it before, which was through the LIU, our IU class, our IU cost in the category above us would increase even more significant because we were able to get it cheaper um, through doing it this way than we were going through the IU. So um, even though it's increased in this area, it saved us money in the area before. Um, the tuition to other LEAs, this is back now. Just like I mentioned on the revenue side, we gain money from Fairfield and Upper Adams. This is where we're paying money to Fairfield and Upper Adams for uh, the consortium classes we use in their districts, okay? So we have more students placed in those uh, districts for those classes. And I will say that these classes, and the reason we have the consortium is to save money on special ed class placements, because if we would put these class, these students in the IU classes, it would be upwards of double the cost. So we do have put things in place to minimize cost, but when we have more students that need the services, obviously it costs more money, um, but we're trying to put them in the most cost-effective placement. Um, the tuition for cyber charter schools. So this number, um, and it's a concern this current fiscal year, I can tell you that uh, because right now it's tracking to be much higher than what is budgeted. Um, the tuition number continues to increase due to the enrollment as well as increasing tuition cost. Um, and like I say here, we're hopeful that the number can be lowered uh, and more students return to our district classrooms, but that's uh, that's a parental decision that we have no say in and we have to pay the bill for that. So this is a significant cost. Right now I'm estimating over two, point, over $2 million for current fiscal year um, for that. So um, this, is, this is one that is always a, I wish I had a crystal ball to know what it's gonna be, but um, hopefully with the, the changes that are happening that we can gain some more students back and save that cost in, in this area. But as of right now, this is one I'm gonna be very conservative on because I don't want to bring it down knowing that potentially it can be much higher. Um, so uh, the other one here um, is tuition other. This is, includes our outside placements uh, for our students, specifically River Rock and Yellow Breaches. Um, we're, and this is actually a decrease, which is good uh, because uh, we're scheduled to have less students attending these uh, placements next school year. Okay. I just wanted to highlight there were two items um, specifically from the high school um, that are currently not in the general fund budget. So the numbers you have, these are not included in those numbers and they're large dollar amounts, um, but it's the auditorium lighting, replacing this current lighting system with LEDs. And then what we're sitting on, refurbishing that 
basically stripping it down and resealing it. Um, now these estimates were, these are not ones that I received. These are numbers that the uh, teachers have received and given in to Mr. Defoe at the high school. So I'm not 100% sure how accurate these numbers are, but that's just, I just wanna put it out there that this is currently not included. Um, they've requested these items in the past. Um, so I'm just throwing it out there to let you know that that is not currently in the budget. Um, and just a caveat here, currently there's no ESSERS money included in the, bu in the budget, okay? Uh, and the reason for this um, is because any revenue we receive, we have to have the offsetting expenses to go against, it, okay? So, um, and that'll show in the estimates when I come into that year. So next year, if we get ESSERS three funding, we're gonna have to have ESSERS three expenditures to go with it. So the, if we get $500,000 of revenue, I'm gonna have to have $500,000 of expenses to cancel those off. So that's why instead of muddying the waters of the general fund with having absolutely no idea currently when we're receiving this money, I kept it out, okay? Um, so there's the figures of, of those items um, overall. Now, obviously we have a, a set aside that we have to do for learning loss, uh, but that's none of that money is included in the current budget, okay? So with that, um, I'll open it up for any questions or discussions. Remember, as, as the months go by, we will continue to get uh, finer details um, of it uh, by, I mean, my hope is that you become more educated and if anything, you get sick and tired of hearing from me about the budget. Uh, but I want you guys to be as informed as you can because it's a big decision you have to make. So my job is to give you as much information as I can and anything that you need. And then ultimately you need to make the decision. So any questions at this point? Yeah, Travis, no, no. Um, on the lighting uh, proposal that they got a quote for, um, is that just the stage lighting or is that like everything? Um, and do you know who they got the proposal from? I do not know who they got the proposal from. And I'm, my understanding is that it's the stage lighting. Okay. That's um, my understanding. I, I, I have a, I mean, I have some knowledge in that area. Um, I was just curious because LED lighting is expensive. Um, but if they're just talking for stage lighting, that quote seems a little high, you know, well, in my, with that number, that's going to have to go out on bid anyway. It, it is. Right. And that we was my, never... that was my curious, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, did, did they get just a random bid and did they right. ask like multiple bids? Um, and the other thing I'm going to throw in and I'm not looking to spend money by no means. I mean, we need to watch the budget, but if they're going to go to the avenue of getting price, um, quotes or estimates for working here. Um, while they're working on the lighting, they should get estimates on improving and fixing some things with the sound system. But no, that was just my question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your thoroughness. I appreciate that. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Myers, who's going to give several presentations related to curriculum. So I guess I need to stop sharing so you can share.
All right, good evening. Um, I was asked to provide some curriculum updates, um, just uh, kind of share out a conversation that Mr. Chubb and Ms. Goulhan and Dr. Hotchkiss and I had prior to break. It was an hour and a half long conversation, but I've condensed everything into three slides. <laughs> so if you have further questions, please feel free to ask. I will share. I mean, and obviously everyone is fully aware that just kind of being new in the position right now, I'm really taking a step back and trying to just kind of assess where we are and where we need to go. Um, so this will be pretty brief. And then in February, you'll hear a more detailed uh, curriculum updated in regards to the high school and some new courses that we're going to be looking at, uh, which I'll share here as well. So just to kind of give some background, um, I've been in the district for 10 years as a teacher administrator and now in my current role. And within that 10 year time frame, um, the last time we did a full rewrite of curriculum was for ELA and math in 2012. And that uh, the reason behind that came from the adoption of Common Core. And so during that time, we uh, spent had small group committees who spent time kind of evaluating the current curriculum, looking at the new standards and establishing frameworks for ELA and math. Um, Curriculum Council has been an established council a committee that has been in the district as long as I'm as long as I've been in here and I'm sure prior to that. And that particular council is comprised of uh, professional staff from all three buildings um, and a variety of positions and roles within the building that um, impact curriculum in some way, shape or form. That council changes from year to year, obviously based on staffing changes, um, needs or focuses of the district um, and typically has met two times a year for about a half day. Um, where the council really has spent time talking about new high school courses, new new curriculum initiatives, and whatnot. Um, in about around 2018-19 was when Dr. Fox really began to start discussions about needing to update our current curriculum. So obviously, we've evolved as a school district in terms of our practice, um, the tools that we're utilizing, and just the way we teach in general. And so ultimately, we knew that we needed to take a step back and really kind of revamp what was currently in place. And so at that point, um, Dr. Fox um, had contracted the services of Heidi Hayes Jacobs, who is a curriculum specialist. And we began working with her as a school district in the 2019-2020 uh, school year. And so while the work started that particular school year, obviously that is the school year that we were shut down. Um, and so with that, it's really kind of been on hold in the sense that PDE released what they call focus standards. And those focus standards were developed last year for school districts, um, knowing that everyone's, everyone's structure as far as what school was looked different. They were uh, priority standards that PDE had selected and identified for schools to focus on during COVID, which was last school year. Um, so fast forward to this school year and um, Dr. Fox has transitioned out and, um, you know, I began in my role October 1st and I'm really, um, for myself, trying to take a step back. Uh, we're in a unique opportunity right now, uh, position right now with ESSERS funding, that ESSERS 3 and the 7% set aside, which we don't know when we're going to get. Um, can be utilized to uh, compensate staff members to help write curriculum in response to COVID and just kind of the learning loss that took place. Um, so with that in mind, what I'm really doing is um, taking a step back. I'm researching other school district processes and best practice. So what, is, what does curriculum look like in a district? What is the best way to go about as far as a needs assessment? Where, how do we prioritize what to start with, what direction to go in? But then also, what are the state initiatives that we have um, set forth? So um, for example, right now, our... Um, the state has approved the new science standards, and those standards are being advanced to the full board meeting uh, this month. And then at that point, um, in about a three to month time frame, what it's almost like a ticking clock. School districts have a three year window to revamp and redevelop uh, new science curriculum based on the new standard adoption. Um, and then at, at the end of that three year window, we have to be in full implementation. Um, so obviously science is definitely an area that's on my radar as far as a need. 
read, the greatest and most noticeable change in the science standards is that they've added a fifth domain for high school um, in the areas of environmental and agricultural science, which I feel we do fairly well here. Um, so really, it's going to just kind of take a look at what we're currently doing and look at the new standards and look, um, do an audit as far as what holes or gaps there might be. Um, in addition to that, the approach to science has shifted um, and that the research is showing that they're looking for uh, teachers to use more of an inquiry based model. So I know when I was in school and probably like many of you up here, it was the teacher stood at the front of the classroom, delivered the, the information, you did a science experiment, and then you wrote a report. And so now the inquiry based model is really about posing a problem and allowing students the opportunity to investigate and explore ways to solve that problem using the scientific methods um, in a more exploratory way. So that requires not just a change in curriculum, but also professional development for teachers. And what does that look like? And how are we going to approach that in the classroom? Um, so science obviously is an area that I think is, is a place that we really probably are going to want to start. But even before doing that, um, my goal right now is to really, the remainder of this school year, take some time to redesign Curriculum Council, what it looks like, how we've utilized it as a district, um, and essentially just... Rather than having a whole council, do we have a whole council and then create subcommittees based on the areas of need that we have set forth? So do we need a science subcommittee, a math subcommittee, and then utilize those committees when the need is there versus um, the entire council? And so in order to be able to do that, what, like I said, what I'm doing right now is working with other assistant superintendents, um, talking with them about what their practice looks like, what, what are their cycles look like as far as revisiting curriculum, um, doing the needs assessment, gap analysis, looking at resources. Um, and then once I'm able to do that and wrap my brain around it, my goal is to really pull together a group this summer to with a possible immediate focus on science and math. So science and math go pretty well together um, as far as content. And I just feel like if we could utilize science and math to really start to develop a model for what curriculum could potentially look like in the district, we could then utilize that model to then um, revamp and kind of update and um, for ELA and for social studies and other areas within the district. Um, so you'll see there that right now I'm really kind of looking at that needs assessment, developing committees, and then utilizing the summer to really establish a plan and then determine when we could potentially have that full implementation and what that would look like after board approval for science and for math. Um, with the goal of needing to be fully approved by the around fall of 2023 in order to start that implementation. Um, again, our immediate needs is really just coming to a common understanding, definition, and beliefs regarding curriculum. A lot has shifted and changed. Um, so really identifying what are the learning outcomes that we want our students to, to walk away with. How are we going to determine whether or not they've achieved those learning outcomes? What assessment tools are we using? what learning activities, what instructional models are we utilizing within the classroom, and then how are we using the content to drive that learning. Um, so that's really what we call a backwards design and something that I'm really hoping to, to spend some time um, educating and providing professional development to staff members prior to even starting the curriculum writing process. I think that this is going to be a huge piece um, as far as, as taking a look and kind of learning as a staff about just that writing process and what that will look like for us as a whole. Um, in February, we will provide up an update and be looking for potential board approval for two new AP courses at the high school. Um, so just excited to be able to offer students um, some, some high achieving courses in which we'll provide them some college credits uh, after, after achieving um, or passing an exam. But uh, so doc or Dr. Mr. Defoe will be here in February to kind of share out those courses. Those courses have been shared with our curriculum council. Curriculum council members have provided feedback, asked questions. Um, so we really feel like we're at a place that we can ask for, uh, present to you for board approval and then make those changes in our high school course catalog prior to students selecting courses for next school year. 
Um, and then again, my, my sole focus and kind of goal is to really continue this needs assessment and then establish some sub subcommittees to then begin developing a plan this summer for potentially really digging into math and science. Any questions specifically about curriculum? I have a question, question about about curriculum council. council. Sure. You're, You're still in the still process, process of figuring out how you want to work with the math, math and the science, the science. This, if you want to go with the subgroups or not. Yes. yes. So how are you going to determine who is on the council and how many people can be on? Can members of the community be involved? Is there a limit on how many people can be involved in these curriculum councils? So there is no limit. Curriculum Council really is um, something that we've utilized as a, well, lots of school districts utilize, um, but typically it is professional staff. So it's teachers really digging into standards, unpacking standards, um, knowing what it is that we need our students to know and be able to do. We don't necessarily dig into the how or um, even more specifically the lesson plans this is really the the this is really kind of the bare bones as far as the framework so it's really what learning outcomes do we have for students what assessments are we going to um, utilize to get a gauge for for uh, proficiency levels um, and then providing some some optional or sample examples of how you could go about that instructionally and then with um, specific content. So again, I'm still in a planning phase as far as gathering data from other school districts to really get some information about how other school districts structure and what that looks like. Um, and I can certainly continue to update and share out as, as um, I begin to kind of plan and move forward with that process. Thank you. How large do you think your subgroups would be? So ideally, anyone should be able to kind of look at standards and help write curriculum, but you really do want to have the experts. Um, I wasn't asking about the makeup. No, I know. No, 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 I know. But, and I don't, so that's where I'm saying, I, I, I'm going to say more heads are better than, than, I don't really have a number. I'm not at, in a position where I want to cap off the number of people that we would have. Um, but what I would like to have is representation from every building. I think that's more important to me. So if I could essentially have two to three staff members per building to represent the different um, grade level spans, I think that would be ideal. Um, I would agree. And the reason why is it, we have this concept called two pizza teams. When you have a very focused defined test, you need to get done quickly. You bring together the experts, but you try to get enough people, two pizzas will feed them. Right. right. Which right. that might that might, might disqualify some people because like Matt, he eats a pizza himself. And so it's gonna be Matt. And... <laughs> right. So you, you know what I mean. But but usually that's usually around eight or nine people. And so the, the subcommittee itself may be smaller. And then as we dig into more unit planning and lesson planning, we obviously can kind of broaden and expand what that would look like. So to be real, one of the one of the this is a stressor that I've I've had for past years and really I think is going to be magnified moving forward. So this this idea of creating subcommittees sounds great and doing curriculum writing is great, but we have to have people that are willing and able to do it when we need to do it typically in the summertime. And so, you know, we don't have a large professional staff. We have 138 staff members that includes everybody um all professional staff you know from nursing to specials to to your your core content and so you have we have this task we also have summer programs that we have to offer and so again we only have a limited number of staff you know we have this idea in the past we've run um, summer literacy camp which requires about 10 to 12 staff members we also have have talked um a lot about doing something specific to incoming kindergartners for them only. So if you start to get 10 to 12 and 10 to 12 and you get 10 to 12, and, and by the way, one of the things that typically prohibits people from working in the summertime is grad classes and childcare. We know that, we hear that. And so I say that because we have all these great ideas, but really what it comes down to, somebody that would really like to serve on this type of committee, um, maybe taking a grad class and they're in a cohort and they're not available. So stay tuned but it is something that i see moving forward that we want to make sure that we're taking care of people um we provide incentive when we get the right people in the right spot but it's definitely going to be interesting to see who wants to do what and and prioritize um you know for us the best people in the in the right spot so stay tuned with that 
Thank you. I think the other headwind you're going to have is I think <clears throat> teachers are going to be a little bit more reluctant to give up their specifically this summer. They're tired between last year and and the first half of this year. They're tired. I you know I, I've I've heard that from more than one teacher, and uh, that could be that could be a potential headwind. I was also asked to share within the curriculum updates um, some information regarding SEL and second step. So um, I've provided again, try not to go too far in depth, but um, this one definitely is going to take a little longer. Um, I'm going to start off really kind of with this overarching uh, definition and kind of understanding of what social emotional learning is, where it came from, um, and why it's become such a focus. And then I'll specifically go a little more into second step um, from there. I will share that I, you know, uh, well, Mrs. Ely is joining us remotely. Um, Mrs. Ely and Mr. Deanna Bell were very, um, involved in the selection and development of a committee to select the second step program that we're currently utilizing. So if any specific questions come up that I can't necessarily answer, Mrs. Ely certainly is here. Um, but I'm hoping I've, I've answered a good many of the questions that have come up. So I'll start by sharing that. Sorry. Yep, new share. How about now? There you go. Yep. Okay. Um, so social emotional learning is comprised of five competencies um, that you'll see you see here on your screen. Essentially, uh, you have this idea of self management, uh, relationship building, self awareness, responsible decision making, and social awareness. So when we talk social emotional learning, again, this is kind of that idea when you hear people say the whole child, social emotional learning is really the start of being able to reach the whole child on an academic level. Um, Pennsylvania lumps some of these together. So while this is the, the big umbrella that, you know, you'll see nationally or, uh, you know, different companies utilizing, Pennsylvania has lumped together the um, self-awareness and self-management under one umbrella, establishing and maintaining relationships is one umbrella, and then they have social problem solving, which includes the social awareness and um, responsible decision making. So they just have three overall kind of umbrellas, if that makes sense. Um, they've taken the five and lumped them together. So I'm really kind of starting at the state level right now. You'll see these first couple of slides um, are from what we call SAS, which is where we get all of our uh, standards from uh, Pennsylvania. So K to two have very specific SEL standards that we are required to embed within our curriculum. I've provided just some examples of what that language looks like. You'll see that manages emotions and behaviors, which is one of the umbrellas. And then you'll see that self-awareness and self-management and self-management. Those are like the overall standard area. And then you'll see it gets more specific as you go down, depending on what you're looking at. This is just one sample of a standard and uh, for kindergarten. So I just kind of wanted you to see um, that this is pulled directly from our state standards that it is a very specific standard that we are required to address. Grades three through 12 are not as specific as K through two. So K through two have a very clear um, identified, they have very clear identified standards that are kind of isolated, whereas what you'll see in grades three through 12, they're more embedded. And so where you'll see them embedded in grades three through 12 are in our health standards and our career readiness standards. Um, one of the responses that we've had to uh, knowing that these standards are embedded within health, so I don't know um, how many of you are aware that I guess 
last year or was it the year prior? Gosh, they're all running together for me. Uh, we only offered health to eighth grade students. Um, we had state standards that um, we were trying to embed within PE at the elementary level, and it was just becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, we were able to take a look at some personnel and make some scheduling changes and add health to third and fourth grades, and then also add health to seventh grades. Um, so it provided more opportunities to embed these types of standards in addition to the state standards that we have for health um, at the elementary level. Level, and then um, we were able to add more of that at the middle school level. So what you see here again is that PA has just lumped those umbrellas into those three different larger categories, but you'll see that there are very specific standards as well for grades three through 12. Um, what I listed or what you see here is another standard at a different grade level. So you'll just see how it builds from grade two, grade three, and grade four, just to kind of show you how, while it's very specific in second grade, they still, and they get that foundation in K through two. What you really see is that once they go beyond K2, um, it starts to build and that standard changes and the expectation and what we want students to know and be able to do uh, changes as well. So if you look at the standard there in the middle where it talks about recognizing conflict situations and identifying strategies to avoid or resolve, the next grade level is then recognizing positive and negative interactions of small group activities. So they're very specific and kind of fluctuate from grade level to grade level because we want them to build over time. Um, this again is just another, I provided an example for pre-K, kindergarten, you'll see a grade one through five, six through eight, I'm not going to read all of this, but again is um, how they've taken a very specific strand um, performance indicator and then um, change that performance, it's a very similar performance indicator, but it builds in and changes a bit in terms of what we're at, we want students to know and be able to do uh, by grade level and also just development and maturity. So all of this information I'm sharing with you right now is coming from the state. These are all resources, the standards, um, the supportive practices, the teaching strategies, all of this is, is, is from the state. So once the state kind of delivers all of this and, and we have these standards that we have to address and make sure we're embedding into a curriculum, we then develop board policy. Uh, within board policy 105, you'll see for the elementary and the middle school, a statement um, in which we include that not only are we offering planned courses and outlines uh, to build strong foundations in verbal mathematical, kind of the academic piece, but we also have to include in there the social and emotional growth. So you'll see that in both elementary and middle school students. In addition to the fact that um, the state has embedded the SEL standards into our career readiness standards, that chapter 339, uh, which came down two or three years ago. Um, so another state initiative that um, it provided kids opportunities and exposure to different careers, um, behaviors, um, and things that our counselors really have to collect artifacts on uh, for each of our individual students uh, in kindergarten and middle school. And I think that even continues, it continues into high school. But within that, they've also embedded these SEL standards. In the spring of 2019, um, Mrs. Yealy and Mr. Deanna Bell attended a national social and emotional learning uh, cohort. They were part of this national cohort. And then um, upon returning from that cohort in which they learned about a lot of different strategies, resources, and ways to address the social emotional learning of students, um, put a committee of teachers together and uh, were able to research and look at a variety of different programs that address social emotional learning. And from that, um, in addition to the fact that it was an approved program through Pennsylvania, Second Step was selected as the resource that the committee felt would best meet our needs. Um, and what you'll see now, so while these standards are older, what you will see now is that research has really um, started to change and kind of really identify what best practice is when it comes to social emotional learning. 
And one of the, the number one recommendations for this is that there is explicit instruction. Um, and so anytime you have that explicit instruction, you also want to ensure that that instruction is cohesive and consistent, especially if you're doing it K through whatever grade level. You want to make sure that your kindergarten students are hearing very similar vocabulary language that can then be carried and embedded and expanded upon in first grade, second grade, third grade, which essentially is what that does. Um, in fall of 2019 was the full K through eight implementation. So again, that 2019 school year is the school year that we shut down in March. And then last year, uh, we had our hybrid year for a good portion of the year. Um, so in, we have a full implementation this year. So what does implementation look like? Oh, and then I added here. The elementary building has taken things a step further, which is fantastic and something that I know that the middle school is really working on. Um, while second step is one component of SEL, so I want to make sure that we understand that SEL is this huge umbrella and it's embedded throughout our entire day, school day, the elementary and the middle schools. It's the way that we, you know, we look at discipline through an SEL lens. No longer do we have zero tolerance policies or just immediate suspensions. We really work through a restorative practice. Um, make sure that we're explicitly teaching behaviors and things that we want, ways that we want students to respond to things that happen in and out of the classroom. Um, it's embedded with, with just interactions as far as guidance counselors and lessons. We as a district have talked so much about mental health and providing additional supports to our students. Um, so not only in addition to our student, our SAP program, student assistant, assistance program, we incorporated PCBH. Um, and most recently, I didn't write it down and I forget the name. What is the name of our new company that the community has access to? Oh, CareSolus. CareSolus, thank you. Um, so really, really trying to, we hear that mental health, not, not just from the community, but from the state and from data that we're looking at as a huge concern. And we're doing everything we can from a comprehensive standpoint to make sure we're addressing it. Um, the elementary building, I just provided here a sample of one grade level um, and just three specific standards. And what they've done is they've taken the SEL standards in K through two, um, created some I can statements that they're using with students in the classroom, and then they've linked the second step lessons that go along with it. So with any good resource, we don't want to use it lock and step. We certainly want to make sure that we're using it with as much fidelity as possible. But if there is a lesson or if there is a resource that does not meet the needs of what it is that we're trying to accomplish, we're not utilizing it or we're looking for a different resource to supplement instead. Um, so I just want to make sure that even even and now this particular slide doesn't share it, but um, there are lessons where they've done them out of order because they're not necessarily meeting the needs of the standards that the grade level teachers have um, identified in their scope and sequence, or it's out of order because of what we felt like was more important than what second step may be identified um, as a particular order. When is second step taught? So second step is a 30 minute lesson, one time a week. Um, so what we've done is um, every grade level, the elementary and the middle school buildings have handled it differently. And we've provided some ownership with grade level teams um, to identify when it best suits them to teach their 30 minute second step lesson. The um, elementary building, the grade level teams, I think all kind of do it differently, but it's not coming from one content area. So if we're talking 30 minutes a week, five minutes, a subject area, essentially, that we're, you know, condensing a schedule of one day a week in order to teach this 30 minute lesson. Um, and then in addition to that, the language and the lessons are then embedded daily in all content areas in different locations of the building. So you, you'll hear or see um, uh, posters that kind of help guide students and remind them of strategies they've learned in the classroom to kind of, uh, whether it's self-manage an emotion or to communicate in a positive manner with a peer or with a staff member. 
There are, um, the elementary building has also done a lot to tie different literature and um, use a lot of the language through their PBIS program. So their PBIS initiatives that they've used in the building, they've really kind of comprehensively linked everything together. So while we're teaching this isolated 30 minute lesson, um, it's still being incorporated and kind of reinforced all throughout the day. Quick question, PBIS, what does that stand for? Sorry, positive behavior interventions and supports. So that is their positive behavior recognition. Um, their SOAR tickets, where they hand out the SOAR tickets. Um, they do, I know the elementary building is really expanded as far as um, house colors and they're focusing on um, different, uh, and actually Mrs. Yale is here. She could certainly share some of that too. There you go. There you go. Oh, that's me. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. I have you unmuted. Okay. I have to mute though. So, so we had started PBIS, I believe the 17, 18 year school year, um, the first year I was assistant principal there. And essentially it's defining expected behaviors in various locations throughout the building. So the cafeteria would be an example. The hallway would be an example. Um, and so all students have visible matrix around the building. So they're able to explicitly see what's expected of them. And then that behavior is reinforced with the SOAR tickets. We've expanded quite a bit. We now have a school store where they're able to use those SOAR tickets to purchase things at the school store. We have Golden Eagle certificates that allow them to be recognized for above and beyond behavior. You may or may not have seen um, yard signs throughout the community that say I'm a Golden Eagle winner. So it's really just um, capitalizing on making great choices around the building. Thank you. Um, in addition to just kind of that, a little bit of information there, I wanted to just share, I know one of the questions was in regards to instructional time. And so what you'll see on the next two slides, um, the, on the your left-hand side, what you'll see are kind of research-based uh, recommendations for each content area um, daily. And then what you'll see is what our what our instructional times look like. Um, so you'll see that for grades K through six, the research or you know professional recommendation is roughly 90 minutes. And for, in a K through six, we're averaging anywhere from 90 to 135 minutes daily. So in a lot of cases, we're getting well beyond what the recommendation is for reading. You'll see the same for math. Um, science and social studies are a little bit different because we teach them, especially at the elementary level, more unit-based. Um, so science typically is only taught for about half of the year, which is very common um, for science and social studies. And then again, um, science is taught for about the other half of the year. And so very typical, you'll see about 30 to 45 minutes um, on average for that particular content area. Yeah, there we go. And then the same for grades seven through 12, you'll see that um, the recommendation or just kind of typical model is 45 to 90 minutes. What I do wanna point out is that the 90 minute models are more block scheduling and we don't utilize block scheduling here. And so while that sounds great, the 90 minutes, they're only meeting for one course for half of a year versus an entire year. So it's really still on average about a 45 minute block of time. Um, and right now, currently, we're averaging anywhere from 42 to 62 minutes daily um, at the um, grade 7 through 12. Um, and just to kind of wrap, well, oh, and then home communication. Um, so there's a lot of home communication as far as um, at the elementary building, as far as PBIS is concerned. And Mr. Sense does a really excellent job of linking the second step lessons to his, PBI, his PBIS bi-monthly newsletter. Um, he provides the second step has a home link connection so that parents can kind of read through and, and see what the lesson was about and what skills or strategies students were taught that day. Um, and then at the middle school level, the grade level teachers should be sharing that out um, after a lesson has taught has been taught. One of the things that we did um, actually more recently discuss is um, potentially possibly sharing the home link prior to the lesson. 
so that families are aware of when the lesson is coming up, can read through the home link sheet, ask questions if there are any, and just be a little more proactive as far as um, what that lesson could potentially have, uh, what that content could look like. Second Step has a really great resource as well for parents on their website. Um, you have to be very cautious. Um, just like any other company, they're designing a product that can be utilized not just here in York Springs, but in any school district across the country. And so they're obviously going to tailor products based on different needs of different communities. Um, there are a lot of supplemental um, resources that are available on Second Step that we do not utilize as a school district. Um, we simply utilize the lessons that were designed within the original program. There are samples on the website that you can kind of click through and see some of the videos for each of the different levels, read through some of the home links and even the uh, student work samples that are per our student um, assignments that are provided as well. Um, and so with that being said, I think what's really important to understand is that, you know, overall, while second step is one small portion of just that social emotional learning, um, it's been proven time and time again that a focus on social emotional learning overall improves academic performance. If our students don't feel safe, if they are worrying about things other than academics, we can stand up in front of a classroom and teach as long as we want, and we're not necessarily going to get across what we need to that day. Um, we are a school district of 42% free and reduced, and so we have students coming to us on a daily basis who are struggling with and have needs that others just don't. Um, but collectively, the goal of SEL is to really just kind of foster that positive attitude foster positive responses and behaviors in the classroom and, and ultimately decrease any behavior so that we can get to the academics. Um, that emotional health has been something that's been on our radars, at least if not prior to um, COVID, at least more importantly now that COVID has really, you know, created this impact where we see more and more that our students are struggling emotionally. As a former elementary principal, and even only for five years, there were drastic differences with each kindergarten group of students that came to us each year. You saw major decreases in their ability to navigate social situations, to regulate and manage emotions. And that is why this program um, was kind of selected and utilized K through eight again, because we really wanted that continuity and consistency and kids to go from grade level to grade level and feel safe knowing, oh, I already know this strategy. Now I'm going to learn how to expand it or utilize it in a different scenario. Um, so with that, if anyone has specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer. We have Mrs. Ely here. Um, and if we don't have an answer, we can certainly get one for you. Thank you for explaining all that. Sure. You know, I just want to say that this is this is really important stuff. And, you know, we think it because it, it doesn't end here. Uh, my, my wife is a college professor and she has and she's been doing it for quite a while. On average, 40 percent of her students are on some sort of anxiety medication. These are nursing students. So these are your pointy type A type personalities. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we don't realize some of the, uh, just some of the, the challenges uh, these kids have. And, and it's, it's coming from places sometimes that we don't even know, as, even as parents, because of social media and, you know, the, the things that are going on there and so on. So to be able to, to start to equip kids at a young age, to start to deal with some of, you know, what's, what's real, what's not. Uh, is I, I think is really helpful. So this this is really good stuff. And I I, I remember distinctly uh, the presentation that was made to the board after uh, Ms. Ely and uh, uh, Mr. Annabelle came back from that conference. And it, that was really I remember that was really good stuff. Yeah, and I would I think the biggest thing you said one word a lot this evening in talking about this that scares people, and that's embedded. You mentioned that word several times. And I think as long as the district is open about, I have nothing against the curriculum. I mean, I understand what it is, but I think as long as the district is open about the curriculum and what it is and what it's, what the intent is, um, 
they're more open to it. But when people, the red, the flags go up, you know, when you, when you hear about the states embedded in this curriculum, and I think that's what scares people, especially in today's climate with a lot of the other curriculum that schools are trying to embed. So. Um, well, and if I can, I'll just add to when I say embed, essentially what, what we're saying is, is that the strategies and the skills that we're teaching in that 30 minute lesson, we're then doing everything we can to incorporate in the cafeteria, in another classroom, in another setting to make sure that there's a transfer. If we just teach it in that 30 minute block of time and then walk away and never reinforce then we're never going to achieve what we set out to achieve. So embed, you know, we embed the language and we embed the standards um, throughout the day. And the standards are, are certainly, uh, you know, up there and, and standards that we've been utilizing for years. Um, but I think maybe the better word to use at this point is to reinforce. We really want to reinforce the skills and the strategies that we're teaching kids. Um, no program is perfect. And that's why I'll, I'll be the first to tell you from an academic standpoint, I struggle with the textbook um, because you, you utilize one textbook and we rob students the opportunity to really, you know, uh, be exposed to different things. And, but, but knowing that this is the intent of using this one program, um, is to develop that cohesive and coherent and just consistent language K through eight, I think is a huge benefit. And for 30 minutes, um, you know, if we can do that in 30 minutes and not take away from that instructional time, full well knowing that we can't even get to the instruction when we have a student coming in who's dealing with trauma or bothered by what happened on the bus or, you know, so-and-so said this to me and I don't know how to regulate or manage that feeling. And we're seeing more and more of that. Um, like I said, just watching some of our, our younger students and, and hearing some of the things that they've been through and, and have, um, experienced in their short life is more than I feel like I'd experience in the time that I've, it's just, it's, they're dealing with more and more and bringing more and more with them to school that we need the tools to be able to help support them beyond just a guidance counselor. You know, when there's one guidance counselor for 600 students, it's just, you're never going to be able to manage that. So this is the, the, uh, I'm a former elementary reading specialist, actually, Dr. Myers was too. And one of the things you learn at the core is the old philosophy of pull out reading approach and you just teach skills in isolation and, you know, kids would do well with you, but then they struggle to apply them back in the context. And really, if you think about what we do with our own kids at home, Hey, I taught you this, but why didn't you make that decision out there? I mean, that's the key, regardless of the content area for us is you teach skills in isolation so that they get it, but ultimately we want them to apply them to a context when they need it. That's the goal. And so that kind of- And reinforce when they use correct, it. Correct, correct. <laughs> and I, you know, just me personally, like today, um, sometimes I have to have meetings with kids and families because of decisions that kids make. And today was one of those days, I had a, had a couple of meetings, but I gotta tell you, I was thoroughly impressed with the level of processing and articulation from the students with what they did and what they want to do and why they did what they, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't seen that in, in quite a while when I talk with a student and the, their decision-making. And I kind of, I reinforce like, I'm really impressed with your eye contact. I'm really impressed with your communication. And I'm really impressed with your reflection. I'll be honest with you. I think that's a reflection of the experience we're giving kids. And it really, it really impressed me. And I think that those, in those situations, the kids are going to do extremely well because of the the whole process they went through to think and to kind of solve this problem that they had. And, and it was a, it was, a, it was actually a hands-on experience that I had today. And I was like, Oh, all right. Good, good job. Good job. Thanks, Dr. Myers. Thanks, Mrs. Ely uh, for being with us uh, tonight. I really appreciate the, the effort that you went through. And so what you guys will start to see as she gets familiar, this is what I want you guys to see is you're going to get little snippets of information from, from experts. And so, you, it won't be uncommon for you to see a principal here, maybe a teacher here to really kind of add context. That's, that's what our goal is. We're going to get that back in order. So thank you. All right. Our next agenda item, Mr. Chubb, if you would like to talk about ACTI. Sure. I would definitely won't be as detailed uh, as our last. <laughs> But um, yeah, I went to the last uh, meeting of the year in December. It was a short meeting. Um, so 
have a few items just to go over, like historical things for definitely board, new board members that aren't aware of the program, a couple data points and a couple announcements and stuff like that. I also printed out um, the agenda. I can pass around if anybody wants to see it, like what, something um, that we go through on a monthly basis sort of thing. Uh, let's see. So first off, I have uh, ACTI consists of five schools districts, which is Littlestown, Conewago, Gettysburg, Fairfield, and Bermudian. Um, the director is Sean Eckenrode, and his accountant is uh, Brittany Mott's Pritt, and they're physically located in Gettysburg uh, High School. We currently have seven programs offered at the 11th, grade, 11th and 12th grade levels. Uh, those programs are Allied Health, Building Trades, Computer Networking, Criminal Justice, Culinary Arts, Diesel Mechanics, and Early Learning. Uh, ACTI would like to expand the program in the future but they're limited at the moment due to lack of available space. Um, some of the basic questions they went over, there's actually an orientation they give to the students, um, 10th graders going to 11th grade, when they make the decision if they want to enroll in the program. So we got a little snapshot of that and they went over the orientation a little bit. Um, some of the questions, uh, some of the data points were how many employees are, there's only 10 employees, um, three administrators and seven are teachers. And for seven programs, they have no substitutes. So that's an issue sometimes when, um, someone gets sick or something happens. Um, enrollment is currently 259 students with a max of 294. Um, the number roughly for Bermuda, and this might be off a bit, they weren't positive. I just asked like offline was like 32. I think it might be higher than that as far as enrollment there. Um, all, all programs earn some college credit, but the type and amount vary. Um, some programs have industrial certifications that uh, students can take. For example, if you're enrolled in computer networking program, you have the opportunity to earn A plus and networking plus certification. Um, and that's through CompTIA, which is an industry standard for certifications. So those are some of the basic things we talked about. Um, there's an announcement, the ACTI open house on January 12th, which is this Wednesday, starting at 5.30 p.m. through 7.30. Um, this event is geared towards 10th graders, students and their families, but is also open to the public. And it's a great opportunity to meet the staff, the teachers, the tour labs, and the classrooms. Um, and then lastly, I had an idea that I wanted to bring up to the board um, that I had after the fact. Um, I talked to the director a little bit offline about it, but I like to throw out the idea to address the expansion of ACTI and the program. And what if we repurposed the possibility of the old middle school? I know there's discussion for the middle school it was going to be used for um, to support the ACTI program. Um, this will allow the program to expand, probably in, uh, in my estimate, at least double in size, if not bigger. Um, it's immediate impact, not just to the Broom students, but other four school districts that participate in the program. Um, I'm not sure how the financials will work, of course, um, how that would, but maybe the four other schools could help find, uh, help fund it, the new building and uh, collaborate on the efforts as far as expanding the programs for ACTI. Um, Again, this is my two cents. It meets a need. Um, it's more opportunity for 11th and 12th graders across the five school districts. Um, it promotes the trades and everything like that. And it better enables the future workforce around county. So it was something that they were talking about, like I said, during their presentation. And I just threw it up there. I didn't say Berm was on the hook for this. I said, have you guys looked at different districts and office space that might be available? So I wanted to bring this back to this board and maybe entertain that question um, if that's something we'll discuss later on. So that's an, I, I threw that out probably a year and a half ago to the ACTI board as a possibility, um, because again, now it's a joint operating board. So the board of AC, ACTI would have to determine that direction. In addition, at the same time, I think Upper Adams had a building um, that they just uh, left and they were looking at. Um, and I know Sean was looking at a couple other possibilities in the, um, central Gettysburg area. And so that's always been the conversation is uh, we've had this vision of you've got this central location, but having some branch, uh, the branch outs. And that's really been, the, we, we have some, uh, and I don't want to put anybody, but we have some local business people that I've had extensive conversation who's, who's has a facility who's kind of offered. And we also threw that out there. And really, I think what will happen with the ACTI with the board is once the real vision and the ultimate goal is established. I do think that there's some possibilities out there within the community to kind of expand opportunities. For instance, 
Every school district at Adams County operates an approved program, an approved program for CT. We have um, ag, uh, horticulture. horticulture, animal science. We have early childhood. Mm -hmm. We've got business and we have diversified occupations. So ACTI has seven. We actually have six approved programs um, and other districts also. So what we've tried to do is to not replicate programs. So if we have a program, we, we don't want you to also run one because now that's not financially going to make sense. But can we offer programs that our students can go to? And, you know, we have a, a neighbor, neighboring school district who just opened up a big uh, CTE wing that has programs that we weren't offered in the consortium. So the goal at some point was to, you know, have some of the consortium students at ACTI be able to attend there. And so that, that'll be interesting to see how your vision goes. I can tell you that I did say, hey, we have a, we have a building. Um, and Upper Adams said, hey, we, we have, a, even though they're not in the consortium, Upper Adams, they've been a member of Cumberland Valley for a long time. They also have a building. So um, it's definitely been, been shared. So it's good stuff. Thank you for serving, by the way, on that board. No problem. Thanks. Dan, I, had a, I have a question. Um, do you have an idea of what kind of programs, if we were able to, some, seems to me maybe that's, I, I like that idea, but if there's an idea then too of what programs ACTI, that might be able to generate some experience. Instead of just looking for expanded programs, do you know exactly what type of things do they want to expand into? There was a couple of programs and I went down the lane, of course, in the, the IT cybersecurity field sort of thing. So right now they, they have like networking, but they like to offer more advanced classes like programming and maybe more advanced networking with switching and stuff like that. And, um, and maybe some of the security side. So just to go beyond that. So I assume the same thing with like just diesel mechanics and things like that. I'm sure there's different phases, different expertise and advancements and whatever they're using for technologies how they want to expand the program. So that was just a couple of the leans we talked about. No, I think that would be great because then if it's a specific, like Dr. Hodges mentioned, whatever other businesses might be then too, if we yeah. can link those two things to the need at ACTI along with an actual business that has space, then maybe that can be the recruiting tool to bring in the people from Fairfield and every place else in Adams County. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm excited about it. Thank you. Uh, Number 15, and I just have a couple <clears throat> miscellaneous items. So I um, want to get a little bit of direction from you um, with some dates. We definitely would like to conduct an open house at the new middle school. So it's just a matter of when and kind of your approach. As I shared before, um, and, and this I'll, I'll use this topic to kind of guide the conversation first. We do not have any flooring in the cafeteria. And that flooring won't be done. Remember, they, they misordered. It'll be completed over um, the Easter break. So first and foremost, do you want to have an open house and wait till that flooring is done? If you do, that's going to be after April. Um, if not, just trying to look ahead here at, at some dates, um, just of when people would be available. And, I, and I've talked to Anthony from Crabtree. I said, talk to me about what you've seen with open houses. And he said, interestingly, he's seen, that's about a 50-50 split. He's seen some districts do it uh, in the middle of the week, do it in the evening. Um, and so historically for us, if you look on the calendar, you'll notice that there are very, very rarely an event on a Wednesday. Wednesday has kind of been that day that we just haven't scheduled events. Um, so I would look at and again, direction from you, do we want to do it on a Wednesday or do we want to do it on a Sunday afternoon? So to me, I'm looking for some guidance. Do you want to wait till the floor is done? And then that'll kind of, that'll give us into the time frame. Or um, if not, then what day of the week do we want to do? It? And I'll, I'll start to roll through some dates. And so here's the, here's the, this is 30,000 foot level to use uh, Justin's terminology. The goal would be to have people come in and explore the building. We're actually going to have students. Students will help. And so we want to have students all over the building to kind of people walk through, explain things. Um, and then at some point, uh, invite people into the gymnasium where we will have you know, probably some words from, from Mike, from myself. I don't know if the, the we'll invite the general contractors, people that have been a part of it. And then at some point we would do that ceremonial ribbon cutting um, for the event. So I'm just looking for a little bit of guidance as to what you guys think. So wait till the floor is done. If you're like, no, let's not wait that long. Then do we want to do it on a Wednesday 
or do you want to do it on a Sunday? And then I've kind of teased through what some some dates and some dates that won't work. So, Pachachas, when does the garage doors in the oh. What, is that also those those right now won't be we're looking at early February. And so right now there's two two of the doors downstairs are in, but there's four in the classrooms that are not in. It, and then there's four uh, creative arts in the science areas. There's eight doors that are not in. And we're we're hearing that it's the February sometime. Frame. So good point. Those those are currently not in. And those are the ones that also don't have power once they're in. <laughs> I just only brought that up because I, I think I've shared with you before. I do think the science area and the creative arts areas are super cool. And I just think the garage doors would add to that. I, I, I yeah, I definitely agree. I have no idea. I, I know what they're telling us. So there's the reality of it actually coming in. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the, and here's the thing. Peep, peep, you're true. I mean, we, anytime, Look, I'm a kid in the candy store. Anybody, somebody wants to go see the building, I take them in. And and we've had people coming in, but I also think that we, at, at some point, we wanna we wanna kind of do this. Personally, invite people and in, come take a look and have kids there. And so, um, I'm just trying to get us organized a little bit. I think once you advertise an open house space, you get less that formal. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and and listen, I, and I don't mind. And sometimes if it works with somebody's schedule, to me, it's it's it's, it's community building. So I, I'm happy to show it at any time to anybody. But I do think kind of giving people that opportunity. I think people are kind of eager to. I want to say it yesterday because <laughs> they're curious because people yep. are seeing the virtual tour. Yep. And they want to get in the building, and the floors. They can conceptualize the floors yeah. in their oh, in their it, mind. It, and, in there, yeah, you can't. It's it can't all be perfect. Oh, I listen, think people I'm just want to see what's I'm, right. a, I'm excited to share. Do you want to do it in the middle of the week, or do you want to do it on a Sunday? I think people working Sunday afternoon would probably be better. Church is done; they would be home maybe after having lunch after church. There's not a lot of sports activities. That might be the most feasible compared to a Wednesday evening where people are working and sports, and so church. on and so forth. And church. And church, and church that's, on Wednesday. That's, that's why we historically don't do things on Wednesdays because of that. That's the, that's the, is that the thoughts of the whole board? Same thing? I, I, yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. I think so. Sundays, we've already given, we could conceivably do it. January 23rd. So it's two weeks. No, if you want me to be there. <laughs> well, and again, that's why I throw it out there. I don't need to be there. No, it, but, but I think that you do. Here in, here You've in already lies seen the, the building, Mike. Here lies the magic. And then the next Sunday that really is available, uh, and I'm thinking, my, my, I don't even know when the Super Bowl is. Perfect. Because the next, honestly, the next Sunday that I have a, that would be available is February 13th. Yeah, that's fine. Too. Yeah. But that's all right. I, yeah, I'm, I'm land, I, I land in Newark that afternoon. So. Huh? No, the 23rd is when we can do it. I'm out of state on the 30th and the 6th. That's not till evening. I would think at two o'clock. That won't interfere with the Super Bowl. Not at all. I mean, that's where I'm kind of at. Like a, a two to <laughs> yeah, a two to four. Well, don't pregame before you come to the open house. <laughs> two o'clock would be good. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but we could do like a I'm gonna two thirty. I'm thinking like a two to four, like two to three, kind of have you know people kind of roam around the building. Say, and again, I'll three o'clock, hey, meet in the gymnasium. We're going to kind of pull people together and talk a little bit. And then whenever we're done, you can go back out to the bidding and kind of building and kind of make it a nice event. That's that's where I'm at. And maybe we'll catch a break in the garage doors. Again. And, and, and yeah, it does give us a little bit of time. And that way Mike can make it 
Yeah. Where he, yeah. you couldn't make it the 23rd. Is that, is that okay? work? And that gives us about a month. 23rd, so January. we could get some, right, get right. Okay. Guys, and I'll be honest with you. We want to get the kids acclimated to the building so they could talk about it. That gives more time, more time to, to do that. Yeah. Right. So let's target, let's target the uh, 13th. And so I, I'm also going to take this opportunity just to kind of revisit a couple of things for you all when we go to the building and just the people in general. And so if you go way, way back, the, the, the whole idea started with the elementary and the middle school had to do with uh, safety. And so we, um, can, we actually had the state police conduct um, a safety assessment. They have a team that that's what they do. And this goes back actually in response to Parkland, if you remember that event that happened. And so we had a, a security and threat assessment completed for the all district facilities. And so um, that information and recommendations were incorporated into elementary and specifically into the middle school. And I'll give you a couple uh, key uh, features that were incorporated. And if you look at both schools, you'll see at the front of the schools, you'll see these bollards, the, the, um, the, the, they're pillars that stand up, they're actually concrete. All of the, prior to that, we had nothing. Um, you'll see bollards in, in, in front of schools. You'll see at entrances, lots of windows. And so one of the recommendations actually from the state police is lots of windows because anybody on the outside thinks everybody's watching them. You never know who is watching you. And that's one of the, the biggest deterrents that, they've, that they have researched to put in place is this idea of you, you can't hide because people can look out. And you know, not that you can necessarily see them, but people can look out. So that was incorporated. And then at the middle school, the separation of uh, bus loop, car loop. The other thing, um, there, there's some, and, I, and again, I'll, I'll, I don't want to give away all the security features, but there's a, there's a new security feature in, in the building that doesn't exist in our other schools. We don't have the infrastructure that really secures the building um, extremely well. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, we're still working on, um, we, put, we have cameras in buildings. Um, not all the cameras are installed there, but we've, we've incorporated, um, and, and Crabtree really led a lot of that uh, safety work into the building. So when you go down there, you'll see uh, some of those pieces of evidence um, in the building, okay? Um, any other questions regarding the building? And I just wanted to just fill you in on two little tidbits, just to clarify. Uh, so last month, um, kind of a flurry with uh, board meeting, health and safety plan, um, our alternate sign-off plan, and then the, 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 the case. And so just to revisit, so you know where we are with the health and safety plan, if you look at it, it's on the website and I have it up here. Really on page three, there's a chart. And the chart is our, our simplified way of saying, here's the requirement, here's what we're doing. And so in the chart, the only piece that is uh, that we've said that we we would um, adhere to a mandate is the universal mask wearing, and so that was the first piece. And it basically says the required to wear a mask will be based on the most recent mandates from CDC, PA, Department of Health, and PD. Obviously, we know where that stands now. All other uh, areas in this chart, there's no no reference to any mandates. If you go to page one, first paragraph you see in black in the 21-22 school year. Um, that will fully reopen. We had, again, we had to write this back in June. Um, in order to prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID, the district will follow the most recent CDC, PA Department of Health and PA Department of Education guidance for the reopening and operation of schools to the greatest extent possible. The reason I'm bringing this up is the health and safety plan really now um, outside of the masks doesn't say that we're gonna, we're gonna comply with any mandate. We'll consider all, but doesn't lock us in. And if you remember the conversation about the greatest extent possible, that was the language that was driving us nuts from the beginning because we couldn't get any specific guidance for it. We put that in there because it gives us flexibility. So in the end, um, and I say this because we don't know what will come down, anything that comes down that um, need, the board needs to consider whether we want to bring it into the district will be in front of you, if that makes sense. Okay, that's the way this plan was designed. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate and, and, and share that with everybody. Um, and then lastly, and I, I'm just, again, I'm using this um, as an opportunity to share. I just, want, I just want everybody to know, the district will never, ever, ever give a vaccination to a student. 
with or without permission. I, there's this idea that, it, and that that out there that somebody's going to we're going to give vaccines to kids without parent permission. First off, we're not in the business of doing that. So no, that's never going to happen. And I always want to couch with if we were approached by, and I just use the example of Walmart pharmacy, if they said, hey, would you consider offering a clinic in your facility after school hours, whenever we would, we did that one other time. If we can provide that service to the community, we'll do that. And I say that now because I don't want people to confuse that with, if I said, we're not going to provide any vaccines, that's, if somebody wants to use the facility, we would do that. But there's this idea out there that we would, that we would do that. No, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not in the business of doing that. Um, and it's just not something. So I just wanted to kind of go on record here by, by putting that out there to everybody. Okay. And also lastly, um, and again, this has been zero uh, conversation, um, more being proactive. So I've shared with you in the past that um, I'm the legislative chairperson for PASA, which is the Pennsylvania Association of School Administrators. So it's my job to represent uh, public school districts across all of Pennsylvania. So we have legislative committee meetings. And so from my stance, if we ever start to see a conversation about um, immunizations to start school, which we have a laundry list of those now for students to be in school, uh, from an advocacy standpoint, if, if all of a sudden the COVID vaccine becomes part of that conversation, um, I, I will advocate that it follows the same process as all the other immunizations to start school. And there is an exemption. It's very clear. And we do that every year. And so I just want you to know, again, this is not out there. Uh, but I'm just trying to be a little bit proactive that that's what my stance would be is there's a process. We, we follow a process now for a laundry list of, of immunizations required actually when you start school and then once you're in school at certain grade levels. And so if and or when it ever gets to this conversation from an advocacy standpoint, I think it should fall into the same way that that has been handled. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thank you for explaining that there's no ma no vaccine mandates at this point for the COVID vaccine. I appreciate that. There is not. Um, I had a couple quick things. The high school plexiglass. Um, when I was there for the football banquet, a couple other parents were there. They had commented that it feels like a prison in here with these plexiglass dividers. Can we take them down? Can we have the principals kind of reevaluate and remove they those? do and that and that's a that's i'll be honest with you that's a building level decision it's their job to kind of manage the building for mitigation strategies we've had the conversation and i know that they are um continuing to review that that comes down to an individual that that comes down to the, to, to the building sure and gotcha. if you go around buildings you'll see different things in different buildings but yeah yes one more quick thing um guidelines were changed as far as uh, quarantining for five days, if you're positive, stay out for five days, come back with five days wearing a mask. Does that also apply for staff and faculty? Yes. Okay, so if a faculty member or staff or whoever were to test positive, mm -hmm. they would only need to be out for five days for COVID quarantine and then they would come back for five days required to wear a mask. Correct. After that, it would be dropped. Correct. Unless the five days only kicks in for staff and students if your symptoms have lessened. So I want to be clear on that. The five days, not a magic number. Your symptoms have to slowly fade. You want to know what the number one issue is right now? Right. And that, that's really important. You want the number one issue is right now? People who say they have symptoms and can't get a test. We're hearing more and more, I, I'm telling you, in the day, today, a couple, like, listen, my doctor's telling me that we sent it out, but we're not going to get the results for four days. Well, after four days, they have been quarantined for seven, so it's exceeded the five. Honestly, that's what's happening right now. So then a staff member who's been out, or a faculty member, they have already been out for five days or more. So if they've been out for 10, 14, 20 days, they can come back to work mask-free, provided they have a decrease in symptoms. Correct. How is that going to be quantified if they have a decrease in symptoms? The way, way we've been doing it all right now, that's actually, uh, it's been the same rule that's been in place, whether it's 10 days, you have to see. Um, and typically we ask for, with its staff members, we ask to have doctor 
that everything is okay. So a doctor's note from a physician stating this person is they're okay to return to, like to, return they're okay to, to come back. Again, here's the issue. Right now we have people that can't be seen by doctors and can't get the test back. And it's it's today it happened a lot. It's I don't know if you've seen that in your practice. Yeah, it's 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 it. Um, at at home tests, people are struggling to find them. So we're we're actually having some creative conversations internally of maybe what we can do to. Walmart yesterday. Oh, good, good. I just, got, I just got some from Amazon. I did too. <laughs> One more quick question. Um, a child was tested. They were exposed to COVID positive people. They were exposed, but resources. Now, this person's child tested negative. But because there was a negative COVID test, they weren't able to get onto the live stream accessibility. But this parent knew their child was exposed and wanted to not expose other children or other anyone else to the COVID virus. Even though her child had tested negative, there was confirmed exposure. So the parent wanted to keep her child out but because there was a negative COVID test, she didn't have access to the live streaming. She should talk to the building principal. That's a building principal conversation. That basically got nowhere. I, I, I disagree. I'm aware of the situation because I was involved. So it, okay. it, sh it should be at the building level. Understood. Thank yep. you. Yep. Dr. Archers, I have, a, some, I have a question. Actually, I have three, I think. So I'm sorry. The, the first one is um, we talked before, you, we mentioned it earlier, I think Dr. Myers mentioned um, like the newsletters or whatever. Um, I think I talked to you previously where um, I get the middle school newsletter because I have children in the middle school. I think that's very valuable because a good insight. And I would like to have that insight maybe to the elementary school and the high school. Is it possible that maybe the board can also get the, high, the elementary and high school newsletters, just like the parents in those buildings would get them? Yes, we can have, there is an individual responsible to push those out and we just want to get you on that list. Either they get it to us and we send to you, but we'll, we'll make some notes. Yeah, I, it just provides more news and insight. Is there? Thank you, yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, <laughs> we can we can we can work to kind of gather that so that you guys. Yeah, yeah. The, the board reports we get are already, and I, and I do think there's clearly some information that is board appropriate. Maybe it's from time to time that shows up in board reports, but I think seeing the information from the perspective of parents, I'd appreciate seeing the elementary and high school as well. I had a second idea or a second question. I think at one point you had mentioned before too about the idea of bringing um, autistic. Uh, teachers into the district as part of our consortium. I know right now we, you say we put that out to the LIU. Is that still something? And of course, Mr. Peart had mentioned that earlier as a budget concern. Is that something that is still ongoing? What's the likelihood of that going to happen? What's, what's the update yeah, so on there, that? Um, another district, another district in our consortium started that process to, to house autistic support. Um, unfortunately, they had gone over, gone through some turnover in staff. And so I'm not quite sure where we are in that process, but it definitely was the conversation because we do believe that we can provide that service, um, a quality service cheaper than what we could do by going to the IU. And so it's definitely uh, started last year, but again, we had some turnover. So I'm just not a hundred percent sure where we are with that, but it's definitely a, it's a, it, we've talked about this for a number of years because we know the number of autistic students in the consortium has just continued to go up. Right. Unlikely probably won't be for us in this budget year. This budget year will still be LIU services, most likely. Mm, when you say this budget year, I would look for any change would be for the 22 23 school. Yeah, that's year. what I meant. Yes. That, that still is a possibility. That, that's still a possibility. And then my last question, then, too, is can you update us on the bus outage that we had earlier this week? Just um, the what? what's our the bus potential oh, problems with the buses earlier this week? Just is there a What's the potential outcome? Is there, what's the good look going so, like forward? And yeah, no, good, good point. So yeah, we um, found out, I guess, middle of the afternoon yesterday at some point that we were going to have a shortage. And so um, I know each of our, 
and this is one of the, the, the benefits of our, our companies is when we have situations like this, they don't really care if they're E&B or Aurora, they help one another. And that's actually what happened. We had one company pick up the route for somebody else, which is, which is great. And some, some drivers, um, you know, what helped today really this morning was other dis some districts to the North delayed. And so there were some drivers available um, and that, that actually helped us. And so um, it's a challenge. And so um, we will do everything we can. We try to have um, other buses pick up, you know, other routes. But if we, if we get into a situation, and other districts have done this, if we get into a situation where we know that we can't fill a route for an extended period of time, and we're really at a loss, that's when we would start to look at um, creating contracts with parents who bring kids to school um, and compensate them for doing so. If we knew it was going to be not just a day, but if we knew that that was going to be how we operate. And I, I know for sure school districts in Pennsylvania Ha that have far more significant shortages of drivers. That's what they're doing. They, they have no other choice. Like vans and that kind of thing? Sure, absolutely. And all of a sudden one, yeah, mom brings yes, 12 kids. That's correct. That's correct. Dad. And not Someone. that that's what you, we don't want to do that. We want to provide this, but you know, we're at the mercy of what's available. And so I just want to thank EMB and Ro for Roars for really working together um, to come up with a solution and Dr. Hunt. Uh, it's stressful uh, because you do want to make sure that students are accounted for um, and it worked out today, but it's, you haven't seen it's happened in the past just yesterday it was more buses and actually a bus that was impact was already picking up students from another route that couldn't be picked up and so you saw this trickle down effect so we ended up uh, ended up working out um well but you know it can happen at any time I i'll be honest with you you've seen other districts if it gets too bad we may have to close school because we don't have drivers i don't ever want to do it but it is a very real possibility and unfortunately, it definitely has happened in our area the last um, past week or so. But that, that's what the ramifications would be if we, we can't get things squared away. So that's not something that we ever want to do. Um, but that's the reality of transportation, unfortunately. So anybody that wants to drive bus, um, they're actually, they're actually um, um, relaxing some of the CDL requirements. In particular, there's legislation out there about some of the, you have to get under the hood and do certain, they're relaxing those requirements because they know that we need people to get um, CDL. So anybody that uh, wants to substitute, um, uh, E&B and Roars would love to have you. Um, no, no question about, I'll also tell you, and, and again, not that I want to, we would want to do this, but I've seen a district that's canceled every after school activity except for sports because they're scheduled. So anything, you know, if there's a, um, Oh, uh, Odyssey of the mind, they're taking a bus somewhere or student council going somewhere. They, they just don't have drivers. I saw another district um, last week that actually the secondary got out of school early so that they could get the kids home and get the secondary kids and continue the after school. Like they were down like 25% of their bus drivers. And so I just share that like those are things that we don't want to do, but we'll work hard not to do. And that's kind of what you saw. Um, yesterday, we, we were able to thankfully get it resolved uh, this morning. We did push out a message this morning to families, um, but any given day it can happen, unfortunately. A financial part to it then too, is that something that happens? We contracted for 16 buses, but they only have 12 that day. Is that something? Yeah, eventually there's, there's a, a monthly bus report with the miles that they go, the passengers. Yes, all of that. Um, and, and keep in mind, uh, transportation reimbursement is always a year in arrears the way it works. You're always behind. Um, but it eventually that will, you know, yes. But, but you could, uh, right, at the, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, if you remember, the one issue was even though um, our carriers were not providing um, services to our students, we still paid the, the contractors. So good. Still Thank you. Support that type of idea yeah. that we still giving them less money right. isn't going to get them more bus drivers. So right. I right. needed to ask. So again, anybody that wants to be a bus driver full time or full time, so to speak, or substitute Roars and E&B, they'd love to hear from you. I hated the bus one. <laughs> <laughs>